or
morning. Uh, uh, would you tell everybody uh, we are uh, going to be getting started in a few minutes? We've got a little bit, a bit of a delay down here, and okay. uh, uh, it won't be long. But I just wanted to uh, give you that information. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anna. Well, at least their humor has arrived. <laughs> configuration. Paula? Oh, okay, good.
Defense ready? Uh, yes. Hey, how are you today? Hello. Would you come down, please? All right. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let's continue with the state's case, Mr. Gravely. Uh, the state calls Christine Rensburg to the stand. Or I just have not turned it on. I apologize. Guilty is charged. All right. By the testimony you're about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I hope you got it. Ms. Ramsburg, you need to speak right into that microphone, okay? I'm going to move the chair quick. Okay, yep. Okay. Okay. Can you state your first and your last name and please spell both your names for the record? 
Christine Rensberg, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-R-E-M-S-B-U-R-G. And Ms. Rensberg, how old, how old are you today? 33. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State Exhibit 42. In the meantime, Ms. Rensburg, while this is being done, um, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Yes. And how many times? Three. Ms. Rensburg, uh, again, I'm going to show you what's been marked as the council's edit. Again, did I, is it 42, Defense Exhibit 40, or is it State Exhibit 42? I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 42 up on the uh, screen. Do you see that uh, picture? Yes. And do you recognize that individual? Yes. What is that individual's name? Zachariah Anderson. Do you see what that person's wearing in terms of uh, 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 above the waist uh, clothing? Yes. And uh, how would you describe that outer garment? His flannel coat. Is that something that you recognize as an uh, item regularly worn by Mr. Anderson? Absolutely. And uh, is this an item that, um, uh, that uh, you have ever came in possession of? In other words, uh, after 2020, was this either, either left at your house or ever something you had? Um, a couple times, like when he would stay over, it could have been left at the house, but I never took it to him or anything like that, and I don't know where it is. Was, uh, have you moved from the house you lived at back in May of 2020? Yes. And was it at your house when you moved? No. Um, so you, you do not believe it was left at your house after uh, your relationship with Mr. Anderson was over? No. Okay. Um, the, uh, is the uh, person you've identified as Mr. Anderson, is he in, here in the courtroom today? Yes. And could you point out where that person's located and what they're wearing? What is the person wearing? He's wearing his blue suit. Uh, can you give me a description of any other uh, uh, item? His tie. And what, what colors are the tie? Blue and red. Uh, I'd ask for the record reflected identification of the defendant. Uh, she's indicating the defendant. Uh, Ms. Renford, uh, during the uh, period of May 19th, 2020, were you over um, at uh, the defendant's home in the evening hours? Yes. How did you come to be at his home on May 19th? He invited me over for a movie night. And how many times do you believe you had been to his house before that? Around three times, occasionally. And um, on the 19th, when you were present, um, did, uh, did you see something happen to Mr. Anderson? In other words, did, was he removed from his home? Yes. So what happened to the defendant? He got arrested. Okay. And how had you gotten to his home on the 19th of May? I drove the 2009 Audi. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 1, photo 271. It's going to go up on the screen. Just tell me if you recognize that item when it comes up. Do you recognize that? Absolutely. What is that? The Audi. And uh, you drove uh, that, and whose car was that in May of 2020? Zachary Anderson's. Okay, so um, how did you come to be a person driving that over to his house on May 19th? I didn't have a car 
due to a car accident I had and I needed a way to get back and forth to work when I was able to go to work after COVID. Prior to uh, May of 2020, how much earlier than that, how many weeks or months or years before that did the defendant give you his Audi to drive, uh, uh, to be your normal transportation? That was the first time. For how long though? For four what? to six weeks. About four to six weeks yes. from the from the date of his arrest? Yes. Okay. And um, during that period of time, did you have that car on an everyday basis because he had lent it to you? Yes. Okay. Uh, so what vehicle, if you know, did the defendant drive during that period of time? His minivan. So I'm going to show you what's been marked as a State's Exhibit 1, a picture 254, and ask you if you recognize that, uh, that uh, particular vehicle. Yes. What vehicle is that? That's his minivan. That's the minivan of the defendants? Yes. So while during that four to six week period you were driving the Audi, uh, to your knowledge, what vehicle was the defendant driving on an everyday basis? The minivan. The one I've identified in this picture? Yes. Um, how often were you in that minivan during the time period of April and May of 2020? Not very often. What, what sort of circumstances would cause you to be in the uh, minivan? It was probably before that, but just going to the grocery store. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit uh, 1, uh, picture 263 for just a moment. Uh, if I told you that's the back of the same minivan, do you recognize uh, the carpet being removed from that minivan? Did you ever see the van like that? No. Um, on May 19th, 2020, when you were present at the defendant's house and he was arrested, um, what was the status of your relationship, if any, with the defendant? We were dating. And how long did you believe or do you believe you had been dating the defendant uh, prior to uh, that time of May 19th, 2020? How long had this been going on? About a year, give or take. About a year? Yep. And uh, how often were you seeing him, uh, it, it, uh, let's say per week during that year? Four to five times a week. And when you say you were, or when I say you were seeing him, what, when you say you saw him four or five nights a week, what did that mean? So in other words, what was going on? He would come over shortly after I got done with work or whatever was going on with his day. We have a movie night, spend the night, and we take off to work and our, do our own thing in the morning. Okay, so I, I want to be sure I have this right. May 19th, 2020, you're saying give or take for about a year, the defendant's been coming to you, uh, to, you guys have been spending the night together four or five nights a week. Is that accurate? Accurate, yes. How many of those nights did you spend at his house? Of those four or five nights a week, how often had you spent the night at his house? It was always my apartment. Okay. When's the first night, if ever, that you spent a night at his house? Oh, I never spent the night over at his house. Was the plan that you were going to spend the night on May 19th? I don't know if that was the plan. It was just being invited over for a movie night. But yeah, at the time, yes, I would. You believe so? Yeah. Okay. Um, where were you working during that period of time? Libby, Montana's. Okay. Now, on May, so that was a Tuesday, May 19th, that he was arrested. Uh, when the defendant was arrested, did law enforcement then also speak to you? Yes, the same night he was arrested. Okay. And did they want to know about the previous Sunday? So two days earlier, two nights earlier? Yes. They were kind of focused on that, weren't they? Yes. And what did you originally tell them that you believed was uh, the whereabouts of the defendant on the evening of May 17th, which would be that Sunday. What did you originally tell him? What I originally told him is that he was over, but like I told them when they look on my phone, it says on my way he was over. If it doesn't, he wasn't there that day. So originally you said you thought he was over there? Yes, originally that's what I said, yes. And did you, did you tell him you thought he came over uh, around 6 o'clock after you got off work? 
Is that what you told him originally? Yeah. Did you tell him, and then he never left the house, did you tell him that's what you originally thought? Yes. And did you say he stayed until about 11 a.m.? Is that what you originally told him? Yes. Okay. Now, did you also mention to him that there was another person who might be even a better source on whether he was at your house or not that night? Did you give him another name of somebody who might know even more or be more sure? Um, what do you mean by that? Well, did you mention that your sister might be somebody who would even know more information or be more sure about it? Yes. Okay. And uh, ultimately, did the officers come back to you yes. and uh, re-question you about the 17th? In other words, what had happened two days earlier? Yes. Okay. And when they did that, did you uh, decide that, in fact, he had not been at your house on the 17th? Yes. Okay. And is one of the things that happened is that you uh, went through your phone or that there was phone evidence where you could tell that he had not come over? I'm going to object yeah. as far as leading. Uh, at some point, did you share phone evidence with law enforcement? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 164. I don't have my glasses with me. Is this hard for you to see? Yeah. Okay. I'm so if, Ms. Ramford, if you have to get closer to be able to see it, please let us know, okay? That, that'll be okay. We'll, we'll have you hold a microphone. Judge, do you still have that microphone up there if she needs it? I do. It? Oh, that's right, that's right there. Oh, sorry. It's got to be turned on. May I, may I have it, please? Oh. Well, you're younger than me. You probably no. could turn it on. I'll let you um, First try, very good. So, and I'm, I'm going to approach just close enough so I can see too. So, let's see. Okay. so um, did you receive a text from Zachariah Anderson's phone uh, to you on your phone at 4.57 p.m. on Sunday, the 17th of May, where he says, cool? Yeah. Okay. And then at 6.35 uh, p.m., do you text uh, the defendant's phone and suggest to him, you got a movie in mind? Yes. And so does that uh, text, uh, uh, is that a text you sent him? Yes. Okay. Um, and with that, so you don't have to read it. Um, does the text, is that all right if I just read it as opposed to making her read it? Fine. Okay. Does the text at uh, 6.35 p.m. to the defendant say from you, Alice in Wonderland, uh, 1933, got to find it and watch it. It's my new mission M. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. That's a movie that you're discussing? Yes. And are you expecting the defendant at that time to still show up at your house? Possibly, yes. Okay. I, I mean, you had plans with him, yes. did you not? Yes. Okay. And so you are suggesting for our movie night, here's what I'm thinking. Yes? Yes. Okay. Any response from him at that time? No. Okay. Now I'm at uh, 9.20 p.m. Up to then, have you received any texts from him or calls from him since you told him, hey, the movie's Alice in Wonderland? Has, there been any t has he been in touch with you in any way? No. Okay. So now at 9.20 p.m., you text him and you say, get to keep kiddos tonight? Is that, is that true? Did you text that? Yes. And you're at 9.20 p.m., right? When you send that, 9.20 yes. p.m.? Okay. Uh, still no response uh, until the next time you text at 10.31? Correct. Right. Okay. At 10.31 p.m., or 10.31.09, do you text the defendant, whatever, going to bed? Yes. Okay. Um, fair to say you're, you're not happy at that point? Yes. Okay. Um, and is the first time you hear from the defendant a text from him that says, fell asleep, sorry, missed afternoon nap? Is that what he said? Yes. Okay. And then uh, 
after that, did you, uh, did you receive a call from I'm going to object to leading again. That's sustained. What, if anything, can you say about later whether you got a call from him? Yes, I don't remember the whole phone conversation, what it was about, but usually we just talk about our day or how we feel and what's going on. All right. And, and did he ever arrive at your home that night? That night, no. Okay. Um, Uh, then uh, the next day, did you uh, have an opportunity to be uh, in texting conversation with uh, the defendant again? Hold on. Yeah. Is the mic still working? You can speak into the normal mic. Okay. Yeah. What was the question again? Yeah, uh, on the next day, so Monday morning, <coughs> were, were you again texting back and forth with the defendant? Yes. Okay. And so I'll ask you if you recognize this text. Can you read that text? It's going to be a long day, still haven't got to work. Oh, no. I'm going, to ob I'm going to object at this point. I'm going to ask that he ask a question and, and she responds. Okay. Well, I'm reading the text. These are these are stipulated records. I'm reading them and asking him, is she familiar with them? Um, I'm not sure if you're suggesting that this is becoming a narrative or it, I'm, if you're objecting to this as being leading or something well one it's it's leading Two, it is a narrative if he's just going to be reading things and at her um, and not sure what the relevancy is of reading every single text message between them um, so if there's a question about a particular text that he has then I would ask that he ask that question well, I think uh, he, can, he can make his presentation. Uh, the objection is overruled. Okay, so again, uh, I'm going to read it just for purposes of you not having to approach. I'm going to read you the content of the text again. Okay. It's going to be a long day, still haven't got to work, hit you up later, babe. Is that a text you received from, uh, from the defendant's phone uh, mm -hmm. on uh, a time period that is Noted is 8:54 a.m. Is that is that a, a time you received that text? Yes. Okay. So when the defendant texted you and said, "I've been, I've had a nap," and so that's why I haven't answered any of your texts. You don't know for sure if he had a nap. Objection before. leading. Well, um, I in this particular question I don't think is suggestive of a particular answer. I, I think it is because I think the proper question, Judge, would be when you received that text, did you know exactly what Mr. Anderson was doing? Well, that would be a better version. I'll, I'll grant you that. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I don't think it's uh, one where there's particular concern about uh, uh, <clears throat> coaxing the witness into a uh, particular answer. So the objections overall. Did you know one way or another whether he was taking a nap when he texted you or had been? How could I? I was at home. Okay. And uh, when you received the uh, 852 text indicating that uh, the defendant had not yet arrived at work, you had no idea where he was, did you? Absolutely not.
Monday, when, uh, after the text that said, uh, uh, I'm not at work yet, do you recall when the first time you saw the defendant was on the 18th? Like, what time did you first meet up with him in any place, your place, his place, on the 18th? Was that Tuesday? It was a Monday. Tuesday. So, what? Was it Tuesday? It was a Monday. <sighs> Only if you know. I don't remember. I just know on Tuesday is the movie night. I was over there around 7. Do you remember telling law enforcement that on uh, May 18th, you went to his home about 6 p.m.? So that would be the Monday that you also oh, went to I'm just confusing dates. Okay. Did yes, you do that, that on was, Mo uh, Monday? On Monday? Yes. But were you also there on Tuesday, the day he was arrested? Yes. Okay. On the 18th, when you went over to his house, so that's that Monday, did you have the Audi that day as well? Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Remsberg. Hi. So I want to go back a little bit. The state had been talking to you about the first statement you gave law enforcement on the 19th, and then the second time you talked to them two days later. Um, you had told law enforcement on the 19th that you had memory problems, and that's why it would probably be better to ask your sister, right? I didn't specifically say that I have memory problems, no, but considering me and my sister lived together and I was going back to work and I do have shit drinks, so no, I'm not good at remembering dates, but knowing my routine, and that was what I told the authorities. So, but when you told them that, it was because you weren't 100% sure. Yes. Okay. Because usually he was over there. The only time that he wasn't over there, either we were working or he was with his kids. And so then on the 21st, which was two days after you first spoke with law enforcement, um, you told them after seeing more information that he was not at the house on the 17th, correct? Correct. And when I got asked and I thought he was there, I even had them look at my phone. So for them to say that I lied or I was covering up and harassed me about it is not right. It's not okay. Because you weren't covering anything up, correct? No, I was just going by memory. I got hit that my boyfriend's in some kind of trouble. I asked the captain what's going on and he couldn't even tell me. I didn't know until later on at all nothing. And everybody feels like they're attacking me from authorities from this way and this is going on. No one really cares about what I go through. I didn't want to come back here because of the harassment I've been through. And I'm here. And it's because law enforcement never really wanted to hear your story, right? Exactly. You felt like they were pressuring you into what well, they I, wanted you to say. I just felt they were thinking I was hiding something, pulling something when there was nothing there to pull. Because when you, when you were with Mr. Anderson on those days and talked to him, there was nothing suspicious, right? Objection. Objection. Calls for hearsay, Judge. Um, the objection, the objection, well, it's leading. This is cross-examination. Right. So I can lead. Yes, you can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was in first year of law school. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, yes, you're correct about that. Um, well, the objections overruled. 
Do you want me to re-ask the question? I just said that during the times from May 17th to May 19th, 2020, when you either saw or were talking to Mr. Anderson, there was nothing suspicious. That, that's an argumentative question based on my new understanding of what argumentative objections are in this courtroom. I'll, I'll, re uh, I'll rephrase it. It asks to make a conclusion, and it's an argument. The objection is, uh, is sustained. When you spoke with Mr. You spoke with Mr. Anderson on May 17th, 2019, correct? Yes, I believe so. And the text message is before that the state had read to you about Mr. Anderson taking a nap. Um, you remember receiving that text? Yes. And you said you had been dating Mr. Anderson for about a year? Yes. And during that year, um, I'm assuming you've known Mr. Anderson to, to sleep? Yes. And were there times where he would also nap? Yes. So receiving a text that he was napping, that wasn't anything out of the ordinary? In, from your experience? No. And it's true too that during your entire re relationship there were times where perhaps you had planned on meeting up but then that didn't happen because something else came up. Yes. Like he had, Mr. An sometimes Mr. Anderson would have his kids. Yes, those schedule would change with the kids often. And sometimes he would be tired from work Absolutely. So it wasn't bizarre that he wasn't able to come over that evening. Judge, again, this is propensity evidence and it's an argument. Uh, it, it, it's actually a follow-up of the state's questioning of her. Objections are ruled. You can answer, answer that question if you remember. Could you repeat it? Please? Yeah, of course. I said that there was nothing bizarre then on the 17th about him not coming over because he had fallen asleep. No, it's not bizarre, no. And when you talked to him, um, there was nothing out of the ordinary about the conversations that you had with him that evening, correct? It calls for hearsay. It's the words talk to him are in it. I'm not asking what he said. The objections overruled. It's a, it's a characterization of a conversation. I apologize, Judge, but I do want to, I do think uh, I am. It, it, it's a characterization, but it's not it is not it is not seeking what is asserted in the conversation to prove the truth of it. It would have to be based on on things that that, that this uh, defense attorney is are not allowed to bring up. So so it is it is hearsay. If if you say I don't want you to say what you what was said, but I want you to tell me whether the conclusion was X, Y, or Z from it. And, and the whole basis of it is verbal or, or is something that was said, that's hearsay. The, the I, is not I, allowed to I that actually, I, I agree with that, but I don't think that what is being asked here is uh, demonstrative of that. This, that it, the, phrase, the, the question began with based on, what he, based on what he said, and then the question was draw a conclusion based on what he said. What he said is hearsay from this the from that side of the The part is not whether the witness drew a conclusions, conclusion. It's if you offer the, well, either the conclusion or the underlying statement to prove the truth of the matter, matter asserted, which would make it hearsay. It, well, it, uh, a, I'm not going to argue about it anymore. Okay. Yeah, overall. Thanks. Was there anything suspicious about that phone call? Uh, uh, can you repeat your question? Sorry. Sure, I'll repeat it in, in full. The, the phone call that you had with Mr. Anderson the evening of May 17th, 2020, there was nothing suspicious about that phone call, correct? No. I would have remembered something otherwise to me. It was just a normal phone call. I don't remember exactly what we talked about even then. 
it's usually around the same thing. It was nothing that I need to put on the schedule, so why would I? And then um, you spoke with him, and then the next morning he texted you that he was, you texted him, and then he texted you back that he was heading to work, right? Yes. And um, that was, was that normal from your observations of Mr. Anderson that he would go to work in the mornings? Yes. And you were aware that Mr. Anderson was doing construction contracting work at a home up in um, Belgium, Wisconsin? Yes. And your understanding, where was Mr. Anderson going to work on that morning when he texts you? I'm not really sure because the boys always did side work and that's the boys thing, you know. Is it, but was he, you knew that he was working at that home around this time? Um, I don't know if it was that day, but I knew they were working on that project, yes. Okay. While you dated Mr. Anderson for the year, did you know him to have any sort of injuries? Um, like what type of injuries are you talking about? Like any sort of things that would prohibit him from moving around freely, any back problems, leg problems, anything yes, of that sort? he has back problems. Okay, can you explain what you, you know of those back problems? Sometimes he just can't move. He either has to lay there or he has to stand up and just keep doing stuff. It's just, it's serious pain enough to where you hold it, hold your back, and you can't move. Okay, and did you ever see him when he would have these moments of back pain? Yes. Direction irrelevant. Whether she's seen other moments unrelated to this time period, it's irrelevant. Uh, and um, how frequent did this happen? Same objection. Oral. How frequently did Mr. Anderson experience back pain and issues? Um, it was daily. Sometimes it was worse. Sometimes some days were better. And do you remember if there were if there was anything that would cause him to have back pain? Heavy lifting that he would end up doing. Okay. And to your knowledge, was it hard for Mr. Anderson to do heavy lifting because of his back issues? Yes. So you had gone over to Mr. Anderson's house from May 18th and on May 18th and May 19th? May 18th and May 19th, you said? Yeah. Yes. And when you were there, Mr. Anderson, was he with you? Yes. And um, you never saw Mr. Anderson with bloody clothes, correct? No. And did you ever see him getting rid of what appeared to be some sort of evidence? No. Was it just a normal weekend and day was for you? Like how he was acting and what you guys were doing? Yeah, what is Objection. Council Monday would be the eighth. Would it be a Monday? Eighteenth and nineteenth. Okay. So when? So when you? I, I apologize. You know, sometimes <laughs> Sorry, us lawyers get our days mixed up too. Um, when you were. Um, together on Monday and Tuesday, what were you guys doing? That's what we normally do. We sit around and talk and just enjoy each other's time. We eat. I would cook breakfast. Okay. So there's nothing out of the... Nothing out of the ordinary at all. Okay. And... Um, On the 19th, so that would have been the Tuesday when you were there, the day Mr. Anderson got arrested, 
Do you remember um, people coming to the house? I sat in the living room. He told me there was trespassers, so I sat in the living room, acted like I was playing a game on my phone. I knew he was on the phone as either his dad or his brother. And then he called the police, and we went to meet the police in the driveway. I remember that day like it was yesterday. Okay. Why don't you talk a little bit more about what you remember? <laughs> okay. Again, Judge, uh, the, the objection is that it's not a specific enough question because it potentially calls for hearsay at, in its general form. So I'd ask that it be more specific simply to prevent hearsay from being presented. Because what the defendant told her would be hearsay. I, so. If I may respond, I just, the first question I asked her was, May 19th, what do you remember? Uh, about two people coming over and she said she remembers that day vividly so then I just asked her well what do you remember about that day that's a fair enough question so she's already if, I apologize finish I didn't need to interrupt you I didn't ask about what any statements were said by Mr. Anderson I'm simply asking her what her recollection was of May 19th 2020 and All right. Yeah, go ahead. Her, her answer to the initial question was uh, what included uh, a couple of things that he told her, okay? So to ask the general question again, to ask to be, to, to have her be more detailed about the general question, does not preclude the hearsay. And I so would, I, I, I'm just, hold on just a minute, counsel. I, I'm, I'm just trying to be, make sure we're a steward of not presenting the evidence that's not permitted. So, uh, so the, if, if I was a lay witness, and I heard, and I had just reported, here's what happened, here's what, here's what somebody said, and then I was asked, can you tell me more about that? I would, of course, go back and report those things again. The first question did not call for that, but the answer included it. And so now, from the state's perspective, to be a good steward and try not to present hearsay evidence, we simply have to ask that the question be more structured. In order for hearsay to be hearsay, it has to be a statement that's used for the truth of the matter asserted. Anything that, if I may judge, thank you, anything that Mr. Anderson told her about sitting down and then her going in and sitting down would be an effect on the listener exception. I'm not looking to seek any of that into, into evidence, nor do I think that's what's been elicited here. But I, it, it's my interpretation he is making a precautionary instruction uh, uh, objection uh, to prevent hearsay from seeping into the record. Uh, you've inquired about the event, and there was reference in the witness's answer to uh, conversational matters, and uh, that is a uh, uh, Area of high risk that the witness will stray into something that would be hearsay. He hasn't claimed that there's been hearsay. Uh, I think what he's asking for uh, is more uh, like abandonment of the sure. of the narrative type answer and ask specific questions. Sure. So as to reduce the risk of hearsay. Sure. So there's nothing for me to sustain or overrule other than I think it's uh, it would be prudent. And uh, let's try that route. So not, I just want you to talk about what you personally saw. Does that make sense? Not anything that Mr. Anderson would have told you? Yes. Um, so in what you personally saw, did you see um, the people who were trespassing on Mr. Anderson's property? No, because why would I step out of the house in danger where there's trespassers when there's a man there calling the cops? The woman should stay in the house and be protected. And did you feel protected by yes. Mr. Anderson? And in your whole year of dating Mr. Anderson, um, did you always feel protected by him? Yes.
your relationship with Mr. Anderson, it was relatively serious, right? Yes. You guys had very strong feelings for each other. Yes. Um, did you ever feel like Mr. Anderson um, was not trying to date you? Mm -hmm. No. And um, were you aware of an individual of who Mr. Anderson's children's mother is? I didn't know what she looked like, but yes, I knew her name and I respected their relationship and him trying, doing his best to be a single dad. Okay. I have no further questions um, subject to recross. Uh, Ms. Ramsberg, um, you were asked a question about uh, whether um, there was any reason for you to believe that you were not in a serious relationship with strong feelings for each other. Um, what, if anything, can you tell us about whether you were aware of any texts uh, or meetings or efforts uh, by the defendant to get back together uh, from January of 2020 through May of 2020 with his ex? Were you aware that he was he making efforts? He did have a dinner with her, and he did tell me about it about where the relationship fell apart, if it's better to get back together. He knew I was willing to let him go, but he showed me that's not what he wanted. So he was telling you, I don't want to get back together with her during that period of time? That's, that's what you were hearing? Yes. Okay. Um, and you indicated that the defendant sometimes had back problems, but you also knew he worked as a contractor, right? Yes. Well, any man that's older everyone's got back problems but he has some severe back problems where he would have really bad days like you do you have really bad days and really good days with your back i in fact do yes yeah. so but so there were good days as well yes okay and then sometimes when heavy lifting happened you are aware that the defendant would have to call and get some assistance for that if he did some heavy lifting he would need to get some i wouldn't care. be aware because i wasn't at work with them oh okay i apologize yeah. i thought you said that you knew that then he sometimes got help for it if he had heavy lifting if he no i wouldn't know because i wouldn't be working with them got it but uh sometimes after heavy lifting is when he appeared to have that back problem yeah that right? of okay. course when someone you're seeing comes over you can tell when they've been in pain because they hurt their back from work or something that day okay so you indicated that on the uh, 18th and 19th nothing seemed out of the ordinary to you uh when you saw him on that monday and tuesday nothing seemed different nothing to, to send any red flags no okay so now i want to turn your attention back to a time period around uh april 24th so just a few weeks earlier okay, okay. during that time period were you also have overnight with him four or five nights a week yes okay and did you notice anything out of the ordinary during that period of time no and now i'm going to turn your attention to may 8th and asked on May 8th, right after, in that week or time period, right after May 8th, were you seeing him four or five nights a week? Yes. And was there anything out of the ordinary in, in his conduct or how he acted towards you or anything during that period of time? No. What about uh, May 13th? Uh, immediately after May 13th, uh, did you um, have uh, anything that happened that seemed out of the ordinary in your mind? No. So um, you indicated you uh, had heard and knew that the defendant worked as a contractor. Were you aware that he was also making money um, in the growing and, and sale of marijuana? I'm going to object. It's argumentative and non-relevant to this case, Judge. So I, I want to make an argument. If, about and relevance. I, if I want to, I'd like this to be heard outside the presence of the jury. I guess it's time for you to leave us alone. Uh, how about a little break? Uh, don't talk about the case during the break. Uh, read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Uh, I'm going to say fifth. Oh, let's say 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I'm told one of the jurors threatened to bring a stopwatch. Uh, yeah. Upstairs. Thank you. Should she leave the stand for the, for she the can. time? Okay. I am.
We'll take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. I don't know, 70 cents. Oh, I think you said 10 minute break and then we'll. Let's start again in 10 minutes. Thank you.
continue, and uh, who, uh, I think uh, Mr. Gridley spoke first. grow operation taking place at the defendant's home that she's at uh, those two days. Right. Uh, so from the state's perspective, this is this only becomes relevant uh, under a line of questioning where Christine Remsburg is asked, um, during uh, this relationship, or have you noticed anything suspicious during these time periods? Uh, is there anything that was out of the ordinary or something that you know that you believe is suspicious? So, so at this point, uh, a very a valid argument from the defense would be Ms. Remsburg, who's in a long-term relationship with him, knows him well, spends four or five nights a week with him, is a purported witness that based on every, that what she knows about him, that there is nothing alarming or suspicious in his conduct that she is observing him. So her quality as an observer certainly now is an issue. And here's what here's my offer of proof to the court, so the court knows where I'm at. She accompanied the defendant to a court hearing on a South Dakota drug case that the defendant had pending during this case. It's a judge. Uh, sorry, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, this is not. It's more of a technical thing. Oh. Um, just because we might be discussing other witnesses' testimony, things of that sort. Uh, Miss Remsburg's in the courtroom. I would just ask for purposes of this discussion that she not be present due to the exclusion order. I agree with that. I, I think it's probably best that she not hear the discussion. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't aware there was an exclusion order, but uh, that's fine. There was. Well, I mean, I guess maybe once or twice. Okay. Yes, we should read. Yeah, maybe read say that. it again. Yeah. yeah. Um, the uh, so should I finish? Yep. Okay. So uh, I, I'm aware that Ms. Remsburg actually accompanied the defendant to the South Dakota uh, to a, a hearing, a substantive hearing on that on that drug case in South Dakota. The allegation in that South Dakota case, uh, which the defendant uh, I believe had pled to and was pending sentencing when the, when this uh, case occurred, when our case occurs, Judge. Um, is for more than 10 pounds of marijuana. So she's aware that it's a significant case. You know, it's not not the end of the world, but a significant case. So uh, she's present for that. And then post or while that proceeding is going on, while those court proceedings are not concluded, um, there is significant evidence of a substantial marijuana grow at this location. So not only is there the potting soil with marijuana uh, accoutrements that the court saw in terms of the bags that were there, but this search warrant uh, found about two pounds of marijuana at the defendant's residence, an operation where uh, there's a process by which you, you uh, either liquefy or tar the marijuana. That's a, this is one of the ways marijuana is produced and, and, and sold to individuals. That, that operation, it, there's a significant evidence of. Uh, there's an entire um, uh, a box or, or container of, of labeled seeds, which are marijuana seeds. They have uh, they have their own sort of uh, handwritten labels of the different categories or types or brands or I guess strains, strains of marijuana uh, that are in there. Um, and uh, and uh, Olivia, uh, I'm sorry, the 12 uh, year old daughter in this case uh, is able to uh, identify the exact number of plants. Uh, that were being grown and describe in detail that operation. So I only give you that as an offer proof because I don't. I, I believe Ms. Remsburg would testify she's unaware. I'm not saying that I would bring up all those details. I'm, I'm simply indicating I believe she would say I'm unaware that any of these, that this is occurring, that there is a marijuana grow occurring. Um, and from my perspective, that piece of evidence indicates to a jury whether she is a credible witness, not about lying, but about her degree of actual knowledge uh, about the activities of the defendant uh, that he doesn't wish to share with her. So the most positive side of his nature. Um, and so again, it's only relevant because the defense has asked her a series of questions, how close they are, and then nothing suspicious. You saw nothing. 
Um, and at that point, whether she is a accurate or clued in observer to his activities, I think is directly relevant. Thank you, Judge. Last time I checked, there's not a single count before this jury for possession of marijuana, possession with intent, manufacture, not a charged offense. Um, it is a charged offense for the exact two pounds of marijuana and grow operation in 20 CF 151 in Ozaki County. That's still a filed only status case. Given that this, um, there are no charges in this case pertaining to a drugs or marijuana, any evidence that the state's attempting to elicit for that is one, not relevant, but more importantly, falls under the curtails of a prior um, bad acts motion or another acts motion. That if the state wanted to get into information that is charged information in an open case that's not relevant to the charges here, but they wanted to use it for some purpose, then that motion should have been brought. Um, asking, when, when asking about suspicious activity, it was about why we are here, not about drug growths or anything like that. And even if the state wanted to try to use that to try to impeach or bolster a position, they still can't use other acts evidence to do that. There's proper evidentiary channels that the state has to go through in order to admit that type of evidence against Mr. Anderson, and they failed to do that. And throughout this trial so far, there's been multiple references or attempts of references to this grow operation, the marijuana fertilizer that was attempted, tried to come in yesterday through um, Detective Anschutz. But now to be going into whether she was aware of Mr. Anderson's dealings with marijuana is wholly irrelevant and it's not, um, it cannot come in as it was, it's other acts evidence that has not been decided on. Well, I, I it doesn't appear to me that it is being offered to prove what you just said, that is any activities of the defendant with respect to marijuana. And that's actually the target of the rule, the other crimes, wrongs, and acts. Uh, rule is actually uh, a rule against uh, showing other behavior of the accused or any other person, but uh, to show that he had acted in conformity with a tra character trait or something. He's not even close to trying to do that. He suggests the reason he is doing it is to demonstrate that uh, Ms. Remsburg is either uh, it does not have the wealth of knowledge that was suggested in the uh, in your examination or um, it could also it could also fall upon her believability in terms of uh, and that's that is a little bit uh, more circuitous uh, route um, because of the, uh, well, it's, as you correctly said, it's an extrinsic matter. Uh, so I don't want to touch that too much other than to suggest that from what the jury's already heard, there's, uh, reason to believe that there were opportunities for her to have seen things that were, what was your word on your examination, suspicious? Correct. Yeah, that would be suspicious now, maybe not suspicious with respect to the um, case involving Mr. Gutierrez, but it would be suspicious. I, mean, I walked in here one day and there's a, a big jar of marijuana seeds, that'd be suspicious. Um, so I, 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 I don't see 
I don't see it. it. I definitely do not see this as evidence of other, other crimes, wrongs, and acts, and definitely not being offered to prove any character trait of the defendant. If I could be further heard. So the defense would disagree in that, the, sure, the state, then why even ask the question if it's not relevant or going to some point that the state's, the state's trying to go to, but under 90403, the defense would maintain the position that even if the court would find that this isn't other acts and that it can go to her credibility, that introducing this type of evidence would be prejudicial to Mr. Anderson. Well, that's a, there's an issue as to whether or not I need to give a curative instruction. Uh, but, uh, and particularly in this day and age, uh, when uh, uh, the uh, so many states are uh, altering their laws, uh, and uh, the governor wants to hear, uh, I, I, it, it doesn't bear the social scorn that it once did, um, and uh, so I. Uh, I don't think the risk of taint is so great, uh, but I, I, I definitely don't think it's being, we, you know, we can lose sight sometimes of we, what the real purpose of the rules of evidence are. And this particular rule, what is uh, to be avoided is introducing evidence that the defendant is uh, reprobate, has a character trait, uh, or a bad character, and to try to offer that to prove that uh, he's acting in conformity with that. That's not even close to what the, the state has attempted to do thus far. And to the extent that they would, they'd, we, I can assure you that uh, there would be extensive discussion discussion as to whether I should let it in and uh, the, uh, those, those enumerated exceptions are directly relevant to the thrust of the rule not to whether uh, there's some uh, casual reference to uh, marijuana that is prohibited by law uh, being available for uh, easy sight uh, under the control of the defendant. So a couple things, Judge. First, um, this is an attempt, how I view it, is this is an attempt from the state to continuously use Mr. Anderson's alleged marijuana dealings this is not the first time the state's brought it up. He's going to bring it up again. The state just admitted to you that he intends on doing it with Olivia Anderson. Well, yes, this, and I commented the other day, I, several times I commented, I, I don't have 1% of the knowledge you folks have about what the evidence in the case shows. Are you suggesting that at some point the state is going to... Um, introduce evidence of drug manufacture or dealing as motivational in respect to this event, this charge? I think what they're attempting to do is to introduce this so that the jury itself can make an inference about people who deal with drugs. And although, sure, this state, are there more, are we on an different trend towards the legalization of marijuana, sure, it's still illegal, and there still are a lot of people who have very strong feelings about people who manufacture um, THC products and deliver marijuana. Not to mention, given that we're not here on a drug case and there was no other other acts case, we did not voir dire on this issue. So true. I don't know if an individual on our jury has a bias towards drug dealers. I'm going to look at this case differently if there's some, some suggestion 
that the defendant uh, w was involved in this incident, if he was involved. I'm talking now about what the district attorney is thinking rather than what I'm thinking. But if there's a suggestion that the state is trying to prove that uh, the conduct uh, attributed to the accused in this case was motivated by something to do with drug trafficking or manufacture or, or sale, uh, that would make a big difference. Although it would also make it more likely the evidence would be received. But um, in the absence of that, then I, I, I think it's a, a casual matter, which uh, in terms of the uh, NO 404, and uh, I don't think it's uh, objectionable. I, and I think, um, you know, I'm going to stand by the point of that it is prejudicial, especially since I didn't voir dire on the issue, since we were given no notice that the state would be going into these types of well, other acts. The and have knowledge that the witness because was going, one of the if they have knowledge that the witness was going to testify as she did. Yes, she's testified well, consistently. Suspicious. You but opened she, the door. But, but when you open opening the door when I'm. When we have a case where you're in a case where you know what the charges are and what the evidence is, when I'm asking about whether something's suspicious, the reference was to this particular matter, why she had been investigated. She was never investigated about Mr. Anderson's alleged drug dealings. She was investigated dealing with the suspicions of Mr. Anderson's dealings with Mr. Gutierrez. And I not once asked outside of a curtail of, other suspicious activity that didn't have to deal with this case, nor did the answer elicit anything that didn't have to deal with this particular case. Back to my issue about the jury and not knowing certain biases, if I knew the state was going to be introducing evidence or attempting to introduce evidence to paint my client as a drug dealer, I would have questioned the jury on who here thinks that drug dealers kill people. Because there's a lot of people that sh that have that thought. So that argument's been repeated a couple times to the court. So the court's heard that now. That's the third time I've heard that repeated. So I, I want to make a record of just sort of where I believe the revisionist history is being declared to the court. So the first time, first of all, no opening part of any statement indicated anything about uh, marijuana or the, ev the substantial evidence that during the search warrant found of a large quantity of marijuana or the search warrant. The first time this came up was when defense, cross-examining uh, Detective Anschutz, asked him whether the, he, they believed his uh, primary source of income was as a contractor. If the court remembers, I indicated that I wanted a sidebar. Does the court recall this? Right. I asked that I wanted a sidebar because it was important to me that that door not be opened unless counsel really wished that to, to be done. because. I'm aware that the defendant is alleged by his daughter and, is, uh, and, and that the search warrant appears to confirm the basic facts that he was growing 72 marijuana plants. I'm also aware that 72 marijuana plants, when I did drug cases a few years ago, is $72,000 of tax-free money, okay? So there's no way his primary income or his, uh, his, his, his income when that is the type of operation we're talking about, is as a contractor. Rather than have the detective who was at the search warrant potentially answer that question truthfully, which is, well, no, I, don't, I think his primary source of income is this, I tried to head that off. Now, uh, counsel changed the question then, right? Ask the question specific to, you know, is, is part of the, jo the job, is part of what this defendant does as a contractor? That appears to be the case, right? So uh, that was me trying to be cautious. The second time I brought this up, Your Honor, was again on cross-examination of uh, Detective Anschutz. She asked about a number of bags up against the barn. Uh, I think there are maybe a dozen bags there. Uh, and Detective Anschutz was asked, did somebody go through this? As if this is an in, uh, inadequate investigation, as the court has heard me talk about several times. Well, those bags are the potting soil and the remains of, from the state's perspective, the 72 marijuana plants 
that his daughter says has just been harvested just before this case. That's why that potting soil, I mean, it's consistent in terms of what, even what a grow operation would look like. So the true answer is, no, we didn't spend a lot of time in those bags because those bags are X, Y, and Z. Uh, that, that would have been the true answer, and that was the first time the door was open. Now the court's already heard my argument about why Ms. Rensburg is not a, crit is not a, uh, is not a valid or uh, a appropriate reporter of whether there are suspicious circumstances going, because I believe she will offer, even though I was at a court appearance of his and knew that he had a marijuana case, a marijuana case that everybody was concerned about, I had no idea that he had a marijuana grow operation while I'm seeing him four or five nights a week. That's not the degree of knowledge where a jury should feel like it's reliable to say, well, she didn't see anything suspicious, therefore we should adopt that in any way. And that's the current state of the cross. So, um, so you know, I, I think the court's made its ruling. I, you know, I don't want us to continue to repeat arguments, but I did want the court to know, I feel we've had a number of circumstances that have opened the door already, and here we are. Not repeating my arguments, making a legitimate full redder, record, very different. Um, as far as the testimony that's come in, Ms. Remsberg stated that they hung out four to five nights a week at her house, not his house that really, as the state nicely pointed out, the only time she really spent there was a couple of days around this time, that the majority of the time, she's not there. Um, so additionally, if he's trying to say that she's aware of his South Dakota marijuana case, and then she's aware of the fact of what his dealings are with marijuana. So if someone's already aware of that, it's not going to be suspicious. If the state wants to go down this well, line of questioning, on, it depends on what the witness understood the question to be asking. Sure. Well, it could have been probed and it still can be. You both got an opportunity to question or more. But as Mr. Uh, Gravely has so eloquently stated, I've already ruled. I don't see this as objectionable. So to the extent that you're objecting, objecting, it's overruled. Well, I'd, I'd then ask that there be lim limits placed because I want it there to be a record that if Attorney Gravely goes into this in any other sort of situation, that there are going to be firm objections coming from this table, Your Honor. Yeah, I, 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 uh, yeah, I mean, I think we'll get there when we get there. Uh, what? I said I'm not going to squelch you. She can make her objections. Sure. Yeah, I, I think we'll get there when we get there. I, I intend at this point, if if she says I had no knowledge of it, then I, I think I have to show that this existed, so that you know it's not a fantasy. Maybe they'll, maybe they want to skip to the circumstances I've talked about. Maybe they want to say, yeah, he grew, you know, but, but. The, she, there, it, it, it's not real unless, I mean, it doesn't mean anything to a jury unless after she's questioned, if she says I knew nothing about it, well, then, then I, I have to do something substantive to at least say that, you know, what's, what's in the bags that you've pointed out. And, and you know, I, I, I don't think, I certainly doesn't need to be extensive. And, and I understand I can't make character arguments about it. I have to stick to where the door's been opened. So I, we'll get there when we get there. To that point, that he still needs to lay a foundation. Did you ever go in the basement of Mr. Anderson's home? That hasn't been testified to. You know, I'm not going to pre-screen what may or may not happen. If you feel he's, uh, his presentation is deficient, then you can enter a, an objection, as you've indicated you will, and then I'll rule on that. But uh, at this yeah. point, I've uh, overruled your objection, and. Uh, uh, if you like, I'll give the jury a short uh, instruction now that uh, they've heard some uh, mention of uh, uh, growing marijuana and uh, that uh, uh, that's to be, uh, that's not relevant to this case. I don't want to say that. He's not charged with that. He's not on trial for that. And it's not something that ought to be considered in terms of uh, the wrong, wrongfulness of that behavior. I think what I will do is not ask for that instruction at this point, Judge, because it may just call more attention to the issue. Makes sense. Um, 
what I may do is ask for cautionary instruction 274, um, other conduct at the end of the case, which I think would address this issue. Um, so I, that would be the defense's position on and that. That's fine. And, and the only thing I'm going to say on that, I probably will, when you get the preliminaries, you'll probably, it'll probably be in there. But if it's not, you better object. To the 274. Our request is requested. Yeah, requested. Understood. Okay. Anything else? All right. Hello. Would you come down, please? Yes. Thank you. She's always so nice. Some are pretty crap. Is this something that's going to? I saw her in the courtroom before. Um, uh, um, is there a mic on over uh, near you? You know, it could be the me t typing too. I've done some typing this morning, but no, I turned it off. But it was on for a while. Yeah, they can look at it. No, not at his residence. You had no knowledge of that? No. Okay. You were, uh, had you been to South Dakota? Had you been to South Dakota with the defendant in the months before May of 2020? When? Uh, oh, hold on, let me finish. As he was going through court appearances on a uh, marijuana case in South Dakota? Yes, I was there for one of his court cases to be there for support. Okay. And to your knowledge, had that case concluded? by May 19th, 2020, or was it still going? It was still going. He had another court date, and then he got arrested for this case. Okay, so knowing that case was pending, in a relationship with the defendant, uh, as you have described, you have no knowledge of a, a grow of marijuana at the defendant's home during the same time period as that court case and as the rest of this? No. I have no uh, other questions for Ms. Ramsburg. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, you may step down, ma'am. Uh, you may step down, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Turgivly.
Matthew you solemnly swear the testimony that you are about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So, if you got, please be seated. Last name for the record. Uh, Eric Widener, W-E-I-D-N-E-R. And uh, officer, how are you employed? Kenosha Police Department. How long have you been so employed? Over 23 years. And um, did you work last night? I did. Are you a third shift officer? I am. So what time did you get off work? Uh, 6.30 today. And have you had uh, any substantial amount of sleep since then? No. Okay. Um, Officer Widener, uh, you, uh, what are your current duties? So in the, in the capacity you're now employed, what do you do? I'm a third shift patrol officer and also the senior evidence uh, technician for the police department. And does that mean that uh, at times at uh, crime scenes you are the person who's detailed with uh, both documenting and then uh, uh, collecting evidence? Yes. Does that include uh, uh, evidence at uh, uh, scenes where blood is located? Yes. How long have you done that in your career where you have been an evidence collection tech? Uh, my first class for when I got certified into it was 2002, so 21 years. And uh, within the Kenosha Police Department, are you the most experienced of the evidence techs at this time? Yes. Uh, how many scenes do you believe that you have been at and uh, had to make decisions about collecting evidence and, and then uh, did, and did collect evidence at in your career? Hundreds. Back on the time period of uh, May 19th, 2020, uh, were you dispatched uh, to a location at 3709 15th Street, Apartment 1B? Yes, I was called in by the Detective Bureau. Uh, and that's not your shift, right? Uh, no. That Okay, and so what? about what time do you believe you arrived there? I think it was noon, something like that, one noon. And again, was that, were you called in off shift because of your uh, experience and capacity as an evidence collection tech? Yes. Okay. Um, while you were at that scene, um, did you uh, observe uh, things that caused you enough concern that you felt, okay, I do have a role here and I am going to be collecting some evidence? Yes. So in, in general wide terms, if you don't have to be specific to all the different areas, but in general wide terms, what was the uh, situation you saw at apartment 1B when you got there? Uh, there was a significant amount of blood evidence inside the apartment. And uh, was that uh, located in one isolated area or was it in several locations? Uh, several locations within the apartment. Now, was there anyone else there at that apartment who was also involved in evidence collection with you? Yes. And who was that? Officer Van Wee. And uh, did you divide up duties in some fashion that the jury should be aware of? Yes. Okay, and, and what was the division of labor? Um, uh, he was documenting the blood stains, and I was collecting uh, samples of the blood, possible blood stains. And so pursuant to that, are you the individual who then uh, specifically took samples of the blood stains you felt were at least of immediate relevance? Yes. Okay. Now, do you have any estimate at the number of individual like droplets or specks or however how would you just how do you want to describe what's the terminology you would use for each individual's uh, place of blood evidence i would say uh blood spatter or blood droplets is pretty much what we're finding all right did you take account of all the blood droplets in other words did you take a total number no okay would that number have been uh, possibly in the thousands had yeah. you yes yes okay easily. at this scene Yes. Okay. And so as, a, uh, as an evidence tech with the experience that you've described since 2002, how do you make a decision about which of those thousands of possible samples to then uh, take a sample, to, to then take more evidence from other than just photos or observation? Um, well, it depends on uh, what I'm looking at. So I div divvy up into different walls or different sections of the carpet or the flooring. Um, and then I would take different samples of that. And are you making a decision uh, believing that you would ever collect all thousands of those samples individually? No, we would never collect that many. Okay. Um, and why are you collecting these? So like, and I'm not saying you know all the details, but w what is, you're collecting them for what to happen next in general? Um, in general, we'll collect them and then we'll send them to the crime lab, State of Wisconsin Crime Lab, where they'll analyze it. So you yourself don't do any testing of them? No. Okay. 
Now, mechanically, um, is there a different process for if you're just trying to collect DNA than if you're trying to than if you're trying to specifically collect something where you suspect it's blood? So, in other words, if you see no blood, are you doing anything differently than if it's something where you say I have a opinion that's blood? DNA, you mean touch DNA? Yeah. Okay. Yes, we would do a different process. Okay. So. First, tell me on touch DNA, if you see that, you would only do that, I assume, if you see no obvious evidence of blood. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Just very briefly, layman's terms, what does that process look like? What are you doing? Um, well, as a door handle, we'll say, as an example, um, with no blood on it, um, I know the suspect may have touched it. I want to collect the DNA samples from his molecules that are on the skin samples that are on the, the doorknob. So I'll take a, a two swabs sterile water and I'll, I'll wet one of the swab tips then I'll wipe it around the um, handle to try and collect that uh, DNA off the handle and then it's still a little bit damp from the from the swab then I'll take the dry swab and I'll wipe that it's called a wet dry method and then I'll package them for uh, processing and um uh, on this particular scene, you had no idea if anyone who had touched a door or any other surface was wearing gloves. Is that correct? You you don't know that at this in this scene, do you? I have no. I have no idea. Okay. Is the method you just described, the touch DNA method, would you expect in your training and experience that that would uh, have any results that would be, uh, have any results if a person was wearing uh, gloves of some kind when they touch the surface? Uh, most likely it wouldn't pick up his DNA if he had gloves on. Okay. Um, so you mentioned how you do touch DNA. So, so what do you do if you see a surface where you think, I think there's a good chance or some chance there's blood there? What, what's different about your process? So um, same kind of swab. It's a sterile swab. We open it up, <clears throat> and if it's blood and it's wet blood, we just dip it into the blood, let it soak up the, the end of the swab. And then we package that. So if if it is if it's still damp blood versus dry blood, is there a different method or is it exactly the same method? Uh, it's a different method. Uh, for that method, we'd have to use a sterile water again and uh, damp the tip of the um, swab, and then work it inside the the stain that I'm trying to collect. And eventually, we'll collect it. It'll get it wet enough. It'll collect onto the end of the swab. So um, were there a number of surfaces where you sought to uh, collect what might be blood evidence at this scene that we've spoken about thus far? Yes. And would you characterize them all as either wet or dry, or did it differ depending on what surface you were looking at? It was different depending on uh, where I was inside the apartment. Okay. And so your method would have altered in that slight way you mentioned. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, and. Uh, did you attempt to take samples from the locations you felt were uh, important in terms of making determinations about what might have happened at the scene? Yes. Um, and uh, did, you, uh, did you prioritize those things you felt were most important? Uh, yeah, systematically we went through and determined what we needed to, co to collect. So. Um, and did you then uh, ultimately uh, document uh, what items uh, that you yourself uh, took um, swabs from? Yes. So uh, is one of the places you took a swab from uh, the top of the dinette table? Yes. And in general, do you remember where that was located in the residence in general? Yes, it's uh, next to the kitchen by the hallway leading to the bathroom and the bedroom. Um, no, just, um... So I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 78. Good news, we're not opening any of these, okay? I'm just going to show you from the labels and from this whether you can talk about it, okay? So Exhibit 78, I'm going to show that to you briefly and ask you, if, based on the documentation on there, you can see that that is from the dinette table and is something you yourself collected. Yes, this is my seal, my uh, initials and date on it, and also the label that we put on it. 
This is something I collected. Okay, and, and it's the apartment we talked about and it's in that process we talked about, correct? Correct. Was that a, a place where you believe there was blood or at least a high possibility of blood? There appeared to be blood stains on top of the table, yes. And that's what you were focused on, correct? Correct. Now, uh, did you also collect in the center of the living room in a, in a large blood stain saturated carpet? Did yes. you also collect there? Yes. All right, uh, and then, so I'm gonna show you exhibit number 79, counsel, um, and ask you if um, that is, if 79 is again something you can confirm for the jury is a, uh, a uh, place where you did the same swabbing process you talked about, and then, and then documented and stored. Yes, this is, uh, again, my initials, my date on it, and also the sticker I put on it, labeling it as a saturated blood area. And in general, can you orient us where that was? So th where is this uh, large blood stain sat at the center of the living room? Um, there's a large, large amount of blood and the carpet, uh, the main carpet of the living room between the TV and the sofa. Then, uh, I'm going to now show you uh, been, what's been marked as States Exhibit 82, asking, were there multiple locations on the living room ceiling that you took swabs? Yes. And why did you not just take one location in the living room ceiling? Why did you, in fact, if I count correctly, why did you take five locations in the living room ceiling at different spots? Um, the ceiling had blood stains on it, and it looked like it was from different events or different uh, times it was put up on the ceiling based on the directionality that we were looking at with the blood stain. So I tried to take uh, samples of each of the events that we noticed. When you say event, do you, is that some object striking blood causing it to, to, to fly? Is that what you're speaking about um, by an event? Yes, the way it, it was put up onto the ceiling, possibly uh, we, without knowing what actually happened during this event, um, it appeared to be either cast off or forcible blood being put onto that uh, surface. Okay, so at the uh, five separate locations that are living room ceilings, you felt it was different than the other four in each one of those, and so significant to put it in, to, to look at that space, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so as, again, back to exhibit 82 then, is this one of the five locations on the living room ceiling uh, that you uh, took swab and preserved it? Yes, this is uh, one of the swabs that we took from the ceiling with my initials and date on it. Again, all told, you took, uh, you took specific stains uh, from five locations on the living room ceiling, is that correct? Correct. Did you take a sample from the uh, exterior door frame? Yes. When you, said, when you say exterior door, uh, do you know if uh, specifically are you speaking about the hallway door or the sliding door? I'm talking about the, there's a shared hallway for the apartment building and this is the door leading into from the shared hallway into the apartment. What did you observe on the frame that caused you to think a swab should be uh, necessary and taken in that situation? Uh, again, possible blood stain evidence was on there. So I'm going to show you what's been marked to States Exhibit 85 and ask you, is that a sample that was a swab from you uh, on that exterior door frame into the hallway?
Yes, this is. It's labeled uh, exterior door frame and also has my initials and date on it. So this is something I put into evidence, collected. Okay, we've spoken about that exterior door. Was that a red door, by the way, if you recall? It was painted red, yes. Okay. Um, and did you also um, see things that concerned you in the center of the exterior door? Yes. Okay. And uh, again, was that possible blood? Yes. Did you swab at that location as well? Yes. This is now uh, the door, the part of the door that faces out in the hallway, correct? The exterior part of the door, yes. Okay. And it's in essentially around the center of the door? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 87. Is that a blood swab uh, again taken from the exterior door center by you and documented? Yes, this is uh, one of the things I put into evidence uh, showing the exterior door center area. Use the same process? Correct. Okay. So uh, see something that you felt was appropriate to swab in the exterior door on the north side of that door? Yes. And uh, was that a separate uh, item or separate area from your perspective than the center of the door that we've already talked about? Yes. And the door frame? Correct. Okay, but it's also still facing the hallway? Yes. Okay, and at that, uh, at that uh, location, did you do, decide to do a separate swab? I did. Okay, um, and uh, that's because you suspected it to be blood evidence? I suspected it to be, yes. And so I'm going to show you what's been marked to State's Exhibit 86 and ask you as to the exterior door on the north side, is that the swab that you collected and documented based on what you can read? Yes, this is uh, with my date, or my, my initials and my date, and also exterior north side of the door is the label. So it is something I did collect. Now, I want to go to that same door, but now on the interior side of that door in the apartment, okay? Was there something uh, regarding the doorknob that caused you to take note and feel it was appropriate to take further action? Yes. And what did you see there? Possible uh, blood stain evidence. Uh, on the knob itself? Correct. And that's on the interior side of that knob? Correct. Okay. And so did you take a swab at that location? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 80 and ask you, again, based on the way you document this, are you able to tell us that um, you uh, that that's that interior doorknob and that, that is uh, your packaging and documentation? Uh, this is something I put into evidence and is labeled interior door. Um, with my initials and my uh, the date on it, so yes, I did put in evidence. And that is that is the that that is the packaging that you put into evidence. Correct. Um, now uh, I'm still on that interior door, um, the uh, same door, but now at the center of the door, about four and a half feet up vertically on that door. Did you see something there that caused you to take further note and believe further action was appropriate? Yes. What did you see there? Uh, some more blood stain evidence. Possible and, uh, and based on that, did you uh, then swab that location? I did. Okay, again, that's interior door, and it's about four and a half feet up? Yes. Did you feel that it was at least worth the swab based on it possibly being a separate? Uh, wh why, why was the door handle not enough if it's on the same door? Um, there's a lot of blood stain evidence, so I wanted to make sure if there was two sources of blood, we got enough uh, swabs for that uh, determination when it comes to the crime lab. And um, so um, in that regard, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 84 and ask you as to 84, uh, is this uh, the swab you took from the interior door center uh, based on what you have uh, described thus far and that you documented? Yes, it's my initials and the date, and it's also the interior door center. Um, I did collect it and package it. Officer, at some point, did you also decide to um, to uh, take a swab from the uh, uh, from the interior uh, patio door handle? Yes. And what were you seeing, if anything, there that caused you to think, okay, this patio door handle is also a place I should preserve uh, the possibility of some evidence? Um, 
Uh, that was more for touch DNA, just okay. to see if the suspect may have touched that door on the way out of the scene. And uh, so that's a touch DNA swab? Correct. No obvious blood present? No. And the collection, you've already testified that how you would have collected that, is that correct? Correct. This is Exhibit 81. I ask you to take a look at 81 and simply tell me uh, whether that documentation confirms that uh, that is that interior patio door swab that we talked about. Uh, it is. It's labeled that way, and my uh, initials and date are on this, and it is something that I collected and packaged. At some point, did you focus on the living room floor and things you believed might be hair? Yes. Did you collect those? I did. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 96 and ask if 96 is something that you documented from the living room floor, indicated, you noted you believed it to be hair and packaged it in a fashion that's uh, reflected in the exhibit. It is uh, something I collected and packaged and it is labeled hair um, with my initials and date on it. 96. I did collect it. Were there multiple locations where you collected hair samples on the living room floor? Yes. Uh, and. Uh, so I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 97 and ask you as to 97, was this also an uh, individual or separate uh, item of hair that you picked up, packaged, and documented as you have described on so many of these other things? It was separate from the last one. It was two different pieces of hair, uh, appear to be hair, um, with the label, my uh, initials, and date on it, and I did collect it. Was there also somewhere on the living room floor uh, a uh, something that appeared to be a piece of wood that had uh, possible blood and possible hair on it? Yes. And where was that located in general in the apartment? Um, it was next to, between the sofa and the kitchen. When you come in, the door is like a little entryway. Um, I think you would call it entryway, and it was right there. And um, in general, you said piece of wood. Did it appear to be a log, uh, or did it appear, if you recall, do you remember any characteristics of um, the piece of wood? It appeared to be like a construction wood. It wasn't like a wood that you would head off a tree, like a tree branch. It was like a construction-type pressed wood. Okay, so an example of that would be uh, a wooden baseball bat? Yes. Uh, or a handle of a, uh, an axe or a hammer or something like that, if it, as long as it had a wooden handle? Yes, it was okay. something manufactured. Okay. Um, and did you collect that as well? Yes. And you believed it might have value because it had both blood and hair on it? At least that was your, your theory as you looked at it visually? It, was, it had both uh, red substance on it and also hair and it was in, on the flooring and nothing else was around it like that, so it was kind of odd. So I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 98 and ask if the item you have so far described to the jury is uh, something you packaged in this particular uh, uh, package and whether that is uh, appears to be accurate in terms of that that particular exhibit is the processing of the item we just talked about. Yes, my uh, initials and date are on these along with the label. Um, I did collect it. Did you also uh, collect uh, So did you also collect a swab from the sofa middle seat of the couch? Yes. And what was significant about the uh, sofa uh, middle seat of the couch that you felt was appropriate to swab? Um, it saturated with possible blood on it. Was that one of the largest poolings of blood at this scene? It was a larger one for the couch, yes. Okay. And so uh, did you take a sample from within that pool? Yes. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as 83, exhibit 83. Does this appear to be a swab of the sample you took from the pooled blood or pooled suspected blood uh, on that uh, couch? Yes, uh, this is one of the items I did collect from the middle of the couch cushion area. Um, my date, uh, the date and my initials are on it, which means I collected it.
We just need uh, half a second, sorry. Yes. Uh, and where is the kitchen counter uh, in comparison to the other places you've spoken about? Uh, when you first walk into the door, it's to the left. What's by? Uh, on the other side of it is the opening for the dinette area. Okay. And uh, was there uh, something of concern uh, from your perspective in terms of what you would do next uh, on the kitchen counter? I believe there's blood evidence on the kitchen counter, too. And uh, did you uh, uh, swab at that location? Yes. I'm going to show you it's been marked as State's Exhibit 88 and ask if uh, this exhibit uh, demonstrates or is the packaging and swab that you got, got from the kitchen cabinet. I'm sorry, kitchen counter. Did I say cabinet? No. Okay. You're good. Oh, kitchen counter. Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, this actually has Officer Van Wee's initials on it, so I believe he may have collected this one. Who? Officer Van Wee. Okay. Is it something that uh, that you can confirm is a uh, collection from the kitchen cabinet? Oh, yes, definitely. It has, it has a label on it for a kitchen counter with the, with the date and his, uh, his initials. Again, we were doing the scene together, so... after your initial um, evidence collection uh, was a did you come to hear that a phone had been recovered from the freezer at the residence yes you had not found the front the phone you and uh, and uh, officer van Wee, is that correct correct um, and uh, at that time did you collect uh, swab evidence from the phone I believe so uh, did, did it appear there was blood on the phone I believe there's some okay. evidence of that. And would you have also swabbed other areas of the phone that maybe didn't have blood, but just based on your knowledge that people touch phones and use phones in ways that might be promising otherwise? Yes, it would be a touch DNA then. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you Exhibit 90. Uh, ask you if this is the blood swab taken from the phone found in the freezer and believed to be the phone of Rosalio Gutierrez. Yes, it was taken from the phone, possible blood stain uh, collection. Again, consistent with the packaging and processing that we've talked about on all the other cases. Yes. As to Exhibit 91, I'm going to ask you, is this the touch DNA, sort of DNA swab of that same? Exhibit 91. Yes, it would be the sides or the areas that did not have uh, blood on them. Uh, we just uh, did the swabbing for touch DNA on that. Do you, do you recall an item uh, having been uh, found in your initial um, collection of evidence? So I'm back on uh, May 19th. Uh, that was on the uh, uh, on the uh, the couch. Remember an item being lying on the couch. You had to be more specific. Yeah. Did you uh, see a wallet or a, sort of a credit card holder that was located on the couch? Yes. 
And um, did you uh, take that, was that taken into evidence as part of this case? Yes. Exhibit 99. So as to Exhibit 99, again, just based on the packaging without opening it, can you tell us, does that appear to be the packaging and uh, the labeling of that wallet? Yes, it is. So what would be your estimate on how much time that you uh, spent at this uh, location uh, collecting these uh, items based on the divisional labor you two had in general? Um, estimation, multiple hours. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Yes, thank you. So the stage has introduced through you um, several, uh, a lot of exhibits. was blood DNA from the phone, right? I, I sure. Oh, you're not going to remember that. There's a lot of them. It's fine. Yes. All right. You're not going to remember them all. I'll be more efficient. Counsel, would it help if I just move to admit them into evidence and then you can just quote off them? Does that help? Um, no, it's not necessary. Okay. Thank okay. you, though. Okay, so out of all of these um, swabs that were taken, there's only two swabs for touch DNA that were introduced. Exhibit 91, which was the, from the cell phone, which you've just previously testified to, correct? Correct. And Exhibit 81, which is the swab from the interior patio door handle, correct? Correct. So out of all of the samples that you took, you only swabbed two locations for touch DNA? No. Okay, what were the other ones you did? Uh, I, uh, there's a bottle of beer. I swabbed uh, uh, where the mouth would be on a bottle of beer where you put your lips on it. I swabbed that and also a water, uh, water bottle that was over by the TV. And um, you also swabbed the um, for DNA touched, for touch evidence, the main door lock too, correct? I would have to look at my photographs for that. I'm not sure if there's blood on that lock or if it was touch DNA. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that was it. Yes.
thoughts on it? up what's been previously marked as Defense Exhibit 60. While you're looking at that exhibit, previously testified, and I want to get your exact words, that it's important to look at areas that the suspect might have touched, correct? Correct. And when you're analyzing areas that a suspect might have touched, it's important to look at any points of entry into a apartment, correct? Correct. So in this case, you did swab the main door for DNA evidence, correct? The front door. Correct. The interior and exterior. Yes. And you swabbed the patio door. Yes. The interior and exterior. Correct. In Exhibit 60, Defense Exhibit 60, you can see that there's a open window. Yes. And you spent several hours at this location, so you're aware that you can access that window from immediately right outside the apartment, correct? Yes. And so, did you swab the window? This is in the bedroom? Correct. No, I did not swab the window. And you agree that could be a point of entry? It could be, yes. So, and it's important, like you said, to swab areas that could have been a point of entry. Correct? Yes. So was this an oversight? No. So why did you not swab this then? Window had absolutely no indicators or evidence of entry or forced entry. It was only open three inches. The screen was still attached to it. There's no scrapings on the screen that shows someone pried it open. To get a screen off from the outside, you would have to have pry marks most likely because um, you take the screens off from the inside. And I saw absolutely nothing that would indicate that someone would have touched, uh, made entry into that window in any way. Well, the window's open, right? It was open three inches. But that would indicate someone opened it three inches at least. Well, based on no evidence on the outside showing forced entry, it looked like someone opened it for ventilation on the inside. That's why there's nothing but done do to that window. But do you know who opened that window? I don't know anything about this scene, ma'am. Uh, no, I don't know who opened the window. You don't know anything about the scene? When I came to that scene, I did not know who touched what. Okay, so you have evidence in a crime scene that there's a window accessible to the outside that's been opened at some point. Objection, this is repetitive and argumentative at this point. You have a window that's been opened at some point. You don't know by whom, and you chose not to swab that for touch DNA. Objection. All of those points have already been covered. Ask and answer. When you arrived on scene, were you in charge of determining the locations that you were going to test yourself, or did people direct you to certain things? Uh, between uh, Officer Van Wee and I, we determined what uh, needed to be swabbed. Okay. So on May 28th, 2000, and I can take that off the Elmo. On May 28th, 2020, 
you had returned back to 3709 apartment 1B because of the cell phone and contents of the wallet that had been found in the freezer, correct? Correct. And you swabbed the cell phone for touch DNA? Uh, either I did or uh, Officer Singh did, who was with me. He's also an evidence technician. So going back to why it's important to swab areas that you believed a suspect could have touched, um, did you swab the cards that were found in the freezer? Cards, what do you mean? There were other items located in the freezer other than the cell phone, correct? Correct. There were um, credit cards? Correct. There was a license? Yes. Okay. So, did you swab any of those items? No. Um, why not? Uh, I'd have to look at the pictures, but I believe they were in a wallet of some kind. Okay. Or they just loose. I'm not positive. I'd have to look at the pictures. It was a money clip? It was some Maybe. sort of clip? Maybe. And um, did you swab whatever was holding the cards? I don't believe so. And that's something that the suspect could have touched, correct? Could have. Did you swab the freezer handle? No. That's something the suspect could have touched, correct? Uh, this is multiple days after the crime scene has been uh, processed, and I believe his mother was in there cleaning the kitchen and she's the one that opened up the freezer and found it and called us. Um, so she has already touched that, so now we're gonna have multiple uh, DNA samples on that, if not wiping away the DNA from whoever initially touched it. But she also admitted to touching the cell phone, right? I don't remember that. When you, lo when you came on scene, the cell phone and the contents of the wallet were on the counter, correct? Correct. And Ms. Patterson told you that she had put them there, correct? All right, possibility, yes. I don't, it's, it's not on top of my head, I'm sorry. I can't remember how it got there. Okay. If I showed you a copy of your report, would that help refresh your recollection? Yes. Yes. Okay. So had Ms. Patterson admitted to you that she touched the cell phone? Yes. Okay. But she touched it, but you still swabbed the cell phone, right? For Correct. touch DNA. Correct. So someone touching something doesn't preclude you from still swabbing for touch DNA. Yeah, actually just it, again it's uh, argumentative based on my current understanding of the objection. Argumentative. You've been in evidence tech for many years, correct? Correct. In your training, you're not precluded from swabbing for touch DNA because more than one individual might have touched an item, correct? Depends on the surface area and what they were touching and how they were touching it. But just in general, doesn't preclude you. Irrelevant whether his training actually precludes him from testing an item after it's been touched prior for touch DNA. 
This witness is, if, if I may, this witness is prior reasoning as to why he didn't swab a certain area in the apartment was because more than one person would have touched it. So I'm now going into that line of questioning to attack that answer. Um, the objection was overruled. You can answer the question if you remember. I don't remember, sorry. It's okay. More than one person touching an item doesn't preclude you generally from taking um, swabs for touch DNA. By saying generally, you're correct. Okay. So in this case, you had the cell phone which had been touched by more than one person to your understanding and you took the touch DNA swab, correct? Objection, that's been asked and answered. I'm going just back to where I was in the beginning, given the officer's answers. Well, that would fit right into the objection that it's asked and answered if you're going back to where you were before. Go just ahead. so we're not confusing. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, I took a swab of the phone. Okay. And so back to the freezer door handle, you could have taken a swab for touch DNA as well. Correct? Objection. It's been asked and answered. She's already asked him, could he have done it? He's, he said he did not, and that he could have. He's already answered this. Um, do you want to respond? Sure. It's it's not really, before his answers to the questions were that he, he didn't say, he said no because someone else touched it. So now I've already established, I'm now going back, I had established that he can take touch DNA swabs when another person has touched it, and now I'm revisiting the issue of the door handle of the freezer all, all under that context. What's been established is his training does not preclude it, and now she's asking the identical question. She already has the answer. He didn't well, do it. Well, I, I, it's going to take more time to argue about it than it is to get the examination. Can you answer the question? Yeah, I was just going to say what was the question, I'm sorry. to rephrase the question. Yeah. Sure. That even though someone else had touched the freezer handle, you can still swab for touch DNA. Or you could have swabbed for touch DNA. I could have, yes. And just like the exterior door handle of the main door, it's more likely that more than one person touched that door handle, correct? Okay. Yes, I guess. And you still swabbed that one? Yes. Okay. And the patio door, the exterior and interior, it's possible that more than one person touched those door handles, but you still swabbed that, correct? Yes. Okay. So back to those credit cards. You could have swabbed those, but you didn't, correct? I did not because they're inside the holder still. Okay. And the holder, you still chose not to test that. I did not. And those are all things that the suspect could have touched, correct? Could have, yes. And so now, when, when, about what time did you respond to the scene back on May 19th, 2020? Uh, my report has it in there. I think it was noon or 1230. I got notified of it. So early, earlier on in the investigation then? Correct. Um, and you were aware that, or were you aware that when law enforcement entered in, the lights had all been turned off? I was not aware of that. Okay. Did you take a video or was that another officer? A crime scene video? I don't remember. Okay. Um, in your experience, if you knew that upon entry, every single light switch had been turned off and this bloodshed event had allegedly occurred, would you want to swab the light switches? Um, if there's evidence that uh, there's blood on those, those light switches that I wanted to collect, then I would. Or if I had any indicators that the lights were turned off by maybe a suspect or the victim, then yes, I would have done that. Okay. And to your understanding, there were no touch DNA swabs taken by you um, of the light switches in that apartment, correct? No, I did not. Um, did you take any um, touch DNA swabs of any kitchen or bathroom faucets? No. 
Um, did you take a touch DNA swab of um, the, well, strike that. Were you were aware, were you aware of the a door mat that had been moved in the apartment? Yes. Did you swab that for touch DNA? No. And it's possible the suspect had moved that, correct? Uh, I'd have to look at the photographs, but I think there's blood uh, evidence on that. And there, there was blood evidence behind the shoe mat, correct? I can't remember. I know there's blood evidence somewhere around there. Okay. Um, and then the couch, um, the couch had been moved as well, correct? The couch? Yeah. I don't remember the couch. I remember the dining room table has been moved. Okay. Well, we'll go back to the couch. We'll stick with the dining room table. Um, the swabs that you mentioned that were from the dining room table that was exhibit um, 78, those were swabs taken of what appeared to be blood, correct? Correct. Um, you didn't take any touch DNA swabs from the kitchenette table, correct? No. And, but you knew that that table had been moved, right? It had been recently moved, yes. Potentially by the suspect. Could have been from anyone, I don't. It could have been from the suspect too, correct? Could have been, yes. Okay. Um, the chairs to the dinette table had also been moved, correct? Correct. Possibly by the suspect, correct? Possibly. You didn't swab the chairs for touch DNA? No, I did not. Um, there were also two small white tables um, that were located close to the the sliding door. Do you remember those? By the patio door? Correct. Yes. Um, you knew that those had been moved at some point too, correct? I did not know that. Okay, but did you swab those for a touch DNA? No. Okay. How about the remote? For TV? Yeah, the TV was on, right? Do you remember? I don't remember that. I'll show you an exhibit. Okay. Judge, I'll, I'll stipulate we've already had uh, uh, Detective Anschutz, I believe, testify that when he entered the residence, the, the TV was on. So that, that's in previous testimony. Yep. So did you swab the remote to the TV for touch DNA? No, okay. I did not. Um, there was a game controller. Do you remember that? Yes. You didn't swab that for touch DNA, correct? No, I did not. Um, the water bottle that was next to the Corona bottles, you didn't process that for DNA, correct? I did one water bottle that was near the Corona bottle uh, by the TV area, the stand area. Did you do that for DNA or for fingerprints? I did that for DNA of the mouth area. Okay. Did you do any fingerprint processing evidence? I do not believe so. Okay. Did you survey outside of the apartment too to look for potential evidence, like the grassy area in front of Mr. Gutierrez's apartment? Yes, I did. Yes, there are patio cement and it went to uh, dirt and then grass. Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 127. Is this 
Madigan's picture of that area that you've been referring to? Yes, the patio doors are up on top. And then on the left, you can see the little cement. That's where the main uh, shared hallway is, the main door going into everyone would use that lives there. Okay, and exhibit 131 is similar, but it is a little bit more of a, a close up, correct? Correct. And I'm gonna zoom in here to see the cigarette butts that you observed on that day. Yes. Okay, zoom back out. Okay, Defense Exhibit 106. This is one of the cigarette butts that was seen and documented, correct? Correct. Did you send that for DNA testing? I don't send anything for DNA testing. Did you process that for DNA testing? No, I did not. Defense Exhibit 107, same question. Um, you obviously didn't send it for DNA testing. Did you process it for DNA testing? No. Defense Exhibit 108. This is another one of the cigarettes, correct? Correct. And you also did not process that cigarette for DNA testing? No, I did not. Defense Exhibit 128. You agree this is another photo of a cigarette butt, correct? Yes. And you did not process that for DNA <coughs> testing? No, I did not. Defense Exhibit 129. These are two cigarette butts right next to each other. You agree? Correct. You did not process either of those for DNA testing. No, I did not. I'll be back, Judge. I know there's some vision issues. Uh, no, I, I'd like to have her finish before the break, if, if, if we can, so that there's a logical break in the, that's my preference. I'm going to let the jury decide. Sure. Um, how many would like to break now? How many would like to uh, give it a little while? Let's, uh, those who want to break now, raise your hands, please. Before I had asked you some questions about a shoe mat, um, do you see that shoe mat in this picture? Yes. Okay. And it's that black rectangular item up against the wall? Correct. Okay. And that's an item that could have been touched by the suspect, but that you didn't process for touch DNA? I did not process it. Process it. Sure. Sorry. Um, Madam Court reporter, that was um, Madam Clerk. 133. 
134. So before, the state had asked you about um, a wallet that I think was Exhibit 99 um, that had been placed on the couch. Was this the wallet you were referring to? Yes. And just for the jury's purpose, that's what's located next to evidence marker number 7, correct? Correct. You didn't process that wallet for touch DNA, correct? No, I collected it. You collected it, but you didn't take any swabs of touch DNA? No. Um, and you, you had observed that there was blood underneath that wallet, correct? Correct. So implying that the wallet obviously then had to be placed on top of that couch at some point after the blood had been there, correct? Correct. So it's possible that the suspect touched that wallet then? That's possible. Okay. The couch um, can look towards where the feet are. Do you see that there's indentations on the carpet from where the couch had previously been standing? And you can get up and look closer if you need to, or I can also hand you the exhibit. I see it. Okay, so you'd agree that there's some indication, some evidence that that couch had been physically moved? Has been recently moved, yes. Recently moved? Yes, based on the carpet still is uh, depressed. Okay, but you did not observe any blood around the base of the couch, correct? I don't recall. Or suspected blood? I don't recall. All right, but you definitely didn't swab any areas around the base of the couch or other areas other than um, the alleged um, blood, suspected blood, correct? There was no other swabbing done? Correct. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as exhibit, defense exhibit 145. Before I had asked you about some white tables, does this refresh your recollection as to where those were? Yes. Okay. And you'd agree that there are several items on the table? Yes. Have any of them, they, really, they seem to be in an exact location as if they haven't been moved, correct? I couldn't hear you, I, counsel. I can't testify sure. to that. I don't so they're nicely placed items, you'd agree? I don't, nicely? I don't understand what you mean. They're placed on there. They're placed on there. They're not on the floor, correct? No, they're not on the floor. Okay. They're items that could have been on the floor at one point. Uh, the objection calls for speculation, whether they were ever on the floor at some point. Uh, I, can re I can lay a better foundation. Yes, you could. Thank you. I will do that. You're an evidence tech, right? Yes. When you process a crime scene, you're to search for every possible piece of evidence that you can find, right? Yes. That's your goal. My job is yes. not to leave any rock unturned, correct? Yes. So if there's there are items that could have been potentially touched or moved in a case where you're trying to determine who's responsible for touching and moving them, it's imperative, it's critical that you test them, correct? Argumentative. This is her argument. I'll move on. You didn't test any of those items on the white tables, correct? Objection. It's already, that has been asked no, and answered. It has not been. I asked about specific items before. Now I'm asking about all the items. How is asking so specific? All of the items, not include the specific items. The, all items include not the specific items. So I didn't previously ask about the rocks or the plant or the other things on these tables. So now I'm asking him that whether he did not process all of those. I did not process those items on the table. Showing you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 146. The glare on this is really terrible. Um, if maybe we could have the lights turned off for this one. Okay. Still not the best. I'm 
might just hand you this exhibit, all right? Defense Exhibit 146. That's the Pam. You can put them back on. It still didn't work. Do you see that dinette table in that exhibit uh, that had been allegedly moved? Yes. Okay. It's in the background. Okay, so I'm going to put it back up here just so then the jury can kind of get a glimpse, even with the, the glare. And Judge has this really great stick that you can use. Um, Judge, if you can have um, that pointer, if you don't mind, officer, just going up there and pointing at where that moved dinette table is. They're here. I don't think the mic. Well, it's a dark thing right here. Okay. Thank you. Now I'm going to show you the Marcus Defense Exhibit 147. So in this picture, um, previously I'd asked you about whether the TV was on. You couldn't remember. The state said they'd stipulate. But in this picture, you see that the TV is, in fact, on, correct? It is on, yes. Objection. Judge, now we're asking questions about stipulated facts? Uh, I, I, well, to begin with, I did, it did, I did not hear what the officer said. So um, she asked him to confirm no, stipulated the, the, facts. This was. Sure, I guess I still want to get the exhibit in, so I have to do it with some witness. So I thought there was a stipulation on the exhibits. There is. So All pictures to, are stipulated. I'll move it in at some point. So. Well, that's different. I'm moving on, Judge. So. Okay. Thank you. Defense Exhibit 148. Did you process the knife in this picture? No. No, I did not. Defense Exhibit 149. Did you process for touch DNA the Canada Dry Ginger Ale bottle in the garbage? No, I did not. Did you process the Corona bottle in the garbage? No, I did not. I'm going to show you what's been marked as a Defense Exhibit 150. To the right of that diffuser, there is an item that have is, has an evidence marker of 15. Do you remember what that item was? I do not remember okay, I'm going to show, item. I'm going to show you Defense Exhibit 151. Again, this glare is very bad. I'm going to hand it to you so you can look at it I first. See it. I see it. Okay. You'd agree that that's a switchblade knife? I don't know if it's a switchblade, but it's a folding knife of some kind. Folding knife yeah. of some kind. You did not process that for touch DNA, correct? No, I did not. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 152. This tool belt was right in front of the sliding patio door, correct? Correct. And these tools were laid out right next to it, correct? I'm object to the characterization of laid out. I would say spilled out. I don't think that laid out is an accurate. Well, term. but the officer is the one who's testifying, so he can use whichever terminology he wants. Uh, the tools are next to the, the, whatever you want to call it, the belt. Okay. and. At some point, they were placed there by someone, correct? Objection. There's a, that would be speculation as opposed to and, falling out of it. And Did you test any of those items that are we can see on the floor? The hammer, the measuring tape, or the nail gun screws or nails? Tested for? Touch DNA. No, I did not. And then when you had gone and looked at the contents of the freezer, you had located Mr. Gutierrez's license, correct? Correct. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 177. Is this an accurate depiction of the license you found or that was found in, this, in the freezer? Yes. Okay. 
And if you could just tell the jury what Mr. Gutierrez's height and weight was listed on this license. Objection. What, based on, why would, why would it be relevant to put his height and weight in at this, in terms of this processor of evidence? Because the state's whole theory is that Mr. Anderson moved Mr. Gutierrez's body. But you're having him, you're having him read an exhibit which is coming in by stipulation. But he found this exhibit. I'm asking what it, what it states. It says what it says. It doesn't somehow sanctify. I don't think there's anything that precludes me from asking a witness about a, 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 a exhibit. The fact, the whole reason that we admitted this is so I could ask, so we could ask questions on any exhibit. That is what is placed in our stipulation. That is the exact words of our stipulation, that we didn't need to have foundation so we could ask any witness of the contents of the photos. I, I have to say, I don't want to call it. I agree with that. I agree that that's true, that any, that a witness can present it. Thank you. Sorry, officer. If you could please just read his weight and height. It says six foot, 270 pounds. Thank you. Further questions at this time? Any question? Yeah, I have a few. The, did you also take swabs for touch DNA at the exterior patio door handle? Objection asked and answered. These are two places where it's not, where we did not. I did ask, I did ask him. Well, because you asked him, does not preclude the district attorney to ask, from asking the identical question overruled. Did you also, so again, my question was, did you take a swab at the exterior patio door handle? Yes. And that was for touch DNA? Correct. As well as the exterior door lock? Correct. Okay. So you saw a bedroom window. Had it been raining for several solid days and raining heavily before your evidence collection on this day? It was. And did that influence decisions you would make about a collection of evidence? Yes. Okay. So when you, for instance, looked at the exterior or that window, the three inches open door window, would you have noted any signs of mud or any kind of way that wet grass might be reflected if somebody had entered that window? Yes, there would have been some indicators as someone was standing in front of the window. There's a gap, probably about, I want to say a foot, maybe less of dirt. Any sign of that having impacted that window in any way that would cause you to suspect entry? No, that's why I didn't take any swabs of it. If there's any indicators of anything, I would have taken a swab of it. Now, officer, you were asked about virtually every item in this entire house and whether you did touch DNA. The, you were asked about the dinette table. Do you have any idea when that dinette table was moved from the other indentations? No. Do you know if, if who moved that, including the defendant, the victim's children? I have no idea. Okay. Do you know if that could have been moved in a struggle or, or when the, when Rosalio Gutierrez might have been trying to steady or, or, or save himself in some fashion? Do you know that one way or another? I do not know that. If you move a dinette table, do you need to use your hands to move it or can you move it using other parts of your body? If you know. You can move it with other parts of your body. Do you even have a way that you would do touch DNA about the movement of a table? How, how would you even do that? Would you have to DNA every part of it? It's legs, it's top. I mean, there's, isn't there a variety of ways you could move a table of that size? Yes. Um, the, uh, the same with the chairs, a person can move a chair with a body either in a struggle or, or trying to steady themselves. Is that right? Correct. Any of this dinette chair could have been moved by a child or an adult. Correct. Any of these chairs? It was a normal chair. Yes. And, uh, and, and H you could grab it from virtually any location and move it. Isn't that right? Correct. 
And so um, is there even a, a way without uh, literally touch dna the entire chair that you would be able to account for whether it was moved in any fashion in that situation? Unless there's some, uh, some visual evidence of that. I did not see any. Within a household, uh, the furnishings, uh, items that look like they're involved in food preparation, all those kind of things, those are, you, would, you would assume as an evidence tech that those are routinely being touched by family members and various people, would you not? Correct. Okay, so um, in, in that situation, you were asked at one point whether your training precludes you from uh, testing for touch DNA on items that you have a reason to suspect have been touched by other parties as well. Um, what is your training about whether there is, whether that is at all promising as a source of DNA? In other words, is that a place that you should be uh, putting your time and attention based on your training if you know it's been touched subsequently or if it's being touched frequently? What is your training about whether touch DNA is uh, efficient or is something that's recommended in that situation? Well, anytime I have any evidence of an item being touched by someone, in especially this kind of a crime scene, I would uh, collect the touch DNA on it. Any items that I did collect is areas that I felt that the suspect would have either uh, entered the place or exited the place or touched during the um, uh, incident. Here's what I'm asking, though. If, if you have reason to believe that, that this is being touched by multiple parties or is a common area where it'd be multiply touched, or if you have reason to believe it's been touched subsequent to the incident, what is your training about whether those are things that are promising for touch DNA? Yeah, I would not uh, collect them based on that reason. Okay, so why? What, what's your training about why that would not be a, something that would be promising? Um, especially if it's after the fact, uh, it would have nothing to do with the incident. Uh, the other thing would be um, if it is touched by multiple people, there's uh, instances where the second person who touches it would take away some of the DNA with them and make it so there's not enough DNA for identification prop, uh, purposes. You were asked about the couch and whether it had been moved. Again, that's an item that, that, uh, that it is, pot that, do you have any reason to know one way or another whether that couch was moved in a struggle or uh, when somebody is uh, uh, falling on it because uh, they, they've been harmed in some fashion? It was pushed backwards, I'm going to say. I couldn't determine that. Okay. Um, the uh, cigarette butts that are in the, were in the front yard area, do you recall seeing those in general in this, in this case? Yes. And uh, would you characterize the area where those cigarette, cigarette butts was located as a, a logical sort of uh, apartment, uh, that particular apartment building smoking area for people who, who aren't smoking indoors? It appeared that way based on by the main front door there. Okay. And, and those were collected, were they not? Correct. Okay. So if, if any party at any point wanted to do testing on those. Judge, I'm going to object. And if I could be here outside the presence of the jury on this. I, I think the time has come for a break. Uh, uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Read watch or listen to any account. And any question other than when we start again? Um, and let's say uh, 1.30. Any question? Okay, thank you. See you soon. Have this discussion at 1.30 or even a slightly earlier if the court wishes rather than argue it now. I'd like to do it now. I, I'd like to, you, you, I'd like to play the card that was played by my co-counsel yesterday, which is that uh, I'm, uh, I feel like uh, the break uh, would benefit uh, parties and then uh, we uh, could be back. Well, we'll come back at 1.20. 1.20? Okay. Thank you.
Well, I wouldn't put anything, I wouldn't add anything. You both wanted to be heard outside the presence of the jury, so here we are. Nice and cozy here. I apologize. My fault, Judge. Yeah. What did you ask? Should uh, I begin my argument? Yeah, where were we? We were, um, I had asked the question of, uh, of uh, Officer Widener, uh, do both parties have an ability to uh, get uh, items tested if they wish, and that question was objected to. Indeed. Well? And the defense's position on that issue, Judge, is that it doesn't, it's not relevant if, it, it's basically implying could the defense have tested, had requested those to be tested. It's not relevant what the defense did or didn't do in this, in this case. Well, it's, it, and it goes to shifting. It's just not relevant because at the end of the day, what's, what other purpose of that question is than to try to use it for argument later that the defense had information that they could have asked to be tested and then that's shifting the burden. We don't have to prove or disprove anything. Well, your point is correct. The problem is uh, the uh, testimonial privilege allowed to the defendant uh, does not extend to in fact I tell the jury when I start at the beginning when I'm uh, I, I have to apologize the, I didn't realize the defendant wasn't in the room and uh, he's just now walked in so um, we're just having discussion about uh, Mr. Uh, Gravely's uh, question about uh, what's 
suggestive of the fact that the defendant could have uh, also had material uh, tested, as indeed he could have. Uh, and uh, you stated that it's they're somewhat attempting to shift, shift the burden and it's irrelevant whether they had anything tested or not. Burden shifting is a concern. Um, on the other hand, uh, it is true that the uh, defense, number one, has the right to have items tested and have items tested by the crime lab and uh, or elsewhere. Um, and number two, unlike the defendant's right of silence, which is constitutionally protected, I'm not aware of any protection to the defendant's decision not to investigate what evidence there might be. Um, but that, of course, that does coexist with the fact that the defendant doesn't have to prove anything. But when you've raised these issues, then it may, I'm wondering, is it fair game uh, for the state to say, well, if, if uh, you were so concerned about the inadequacy of the police investigation, what is you about it? But then how is that not putting a burden on the defense to prove something or explain to the jury why we did or did not do something? It's completely irrelevant. Our whole theory is, they, the, the theory of it was inadequate policing, um, inadequate investigation, inadequate testing of information, those facts exist. It was in the possession of the state, they didn't test it. That doesn't then open the door to be able to say, oh, we're gonna actually now point the finger at the defense that they didn't test anything. And also then it's forcing us to provide an explanation and who's supposed to testify to that judge? Well, uh, the issue I think does arise. What what uh, what evidence do you have that had such an investigation been conducted, it would it would have led in a different direction? I, I have no such evidence. I haven't made a suggestion that it would have. In fact, we've affirmatively suggested the exact opposite that we tested those items that were uh, appropriate. And uh, of course, every question of the defense. I mean, at this point, there was a. There was an hour of cross-examination prior to my question that was all about, did you submit this item to the crime lab? Did you uh, analyze this item? I mean, you know, this, is, this has been a theme that has not just been a one-off argument. It has been a theme that has been uh, repeated for now hours in front of this jury. Um, this is a standard question by this prosecution. I, I have, you know, for, for whatever, per I mean, I, this is, uh, this is prosecutor training 101. You're not allowed to go any further. You, you have to ask only this question. Uh, I know the court has heard me ask this question several times in this courtroom. Uh, the, the, this question itself, uh, do both sides have an ability to test the items? Well, I don't know if you, I, I have told the jury that. Yeah, you have. I told the jury I, I, that. I, I told them at the beginning that uh, Everything is intended to be equal, uh, other than the fact that this, the system is deliberately biased in favor of the defendant, but that both sides have the right to force witnesses. Uh, I guess I, I don't know that I mentioned uh, uh, testing, but I, certainly I did indicate that we tried to keep things on even keel here. However, I've been here on prior occasions where the court has said that to jurors, where, where you have indicated to jurors, to juries that both sides have this ability. Um, there are people that wouldn't like to hear that you have cited me as president. Well, uh, it feels like the ideal court to do so. Uh, um, so, uh, but, but your honor, I, you know, this is, I, for me, this is, this is, there is no case law that prohibits this. Um, and uh, frankly, there, there isn't a case the court will hear where this is more appropriate as the counter argument. And obviously, I, I you know, it, it, it is important that I not shift the burden. I can't say they have an obligation to test or anything that would color it in that fashion. 
I have to live with, both sides have the ability to test. If the defense feels that it is appropriate to test, they have that ability. I, I'm, I'm limited to that argument, and that is as far as I intend to take it, it's a one question question of this witness. Uh, it might be a question asked to other witnesses in response to certainly lengthy interrogation, uh, I'm sorry, not interrogation, cross-examination of this sort. Uh, and uh, of course it is for purposes of the state making an argument later. Yes, that is, that is uh, the, the, the point. Again, what the defense did or did not do is 100% not relevant in this trial. So for the state to try to say, oh, yep, now we may use this as an argument later, their only argument is that the defense could have had this tested and they chose not to. So then we're put in a really weird situation, Judge, where then it seems that one of us have to be called to talk about why we don't do that. And the state saying that there's no authority to ban this type of questioning, that he's asked this hundreds of times, well, perhaps a defense counsel has not been adamant about their appropriate objection when it comes to the bur shifting of a burden. Well, but regardless, I... there's also, the, and I stand that my objection is firmly rooted in law. I can find a case on the issue as far as burden shifting, requiring the defense um, to provide information to a jury. Um, but I can also guarantee that there's no authority that allows the prosecutor to ask such questions that are completely irrelevant. Relevancy, as this court is well aware. I don't know how you can say it's irrelevant when you have, it's, it's irrelevant. from the get-go in this case, you've uh, uh, said the case has been improperly or under investigated. Sure. So what does me having to do something? How does that change the police investigation? Am I the police? No. Okay. So then what doesn't I'm not accusing myself of doing something wrong. I'm attacking the police investigation. What I did or didn't do has absolutely zero impact on police conduct in their investigation in this case. Well, the jury has been and will be instructed again that the burden of proof is entirely on the state and uh, and um, as i said a moment ago the defendant's uh, right of silence has no uh, replication anywhere else in the array of criminal rights that is a sacred right um, and um, so the fact that he's not com permitted to comment on post-arrest silence, it does not follow from that that he can't comment on uh, failure to investigate, as long as the jury understands but I have that he continues to carry the burden of proof. But judge, it's implying that we have some sort of obligation, and if in closing arguments he gets up there and tells the jury, the defense could have had this tested and they did not. How is that not shifting the burden to the defense? Because he's not telling the jury that you had to. But, but it, it's implied. It's going to leave the jurors in the mind of that the defense didn't do something that they're required to do. I, I believe me, he's not going to be allowed to tell the jury that the defense was required to conduct any investigation at all. But whether he can plant that seed with them. But uh, see, because that's the problem. Planting a seed for what, Judge? For the conduct that the defense didn't take. The jury. How is, that, how is that permissible under the law? That's shifting the burden. No, no, that's no, no, saying no. We're planting now a seed. Now you've got the burden. You've got to tell me why that isn't in accordance with our law. Because it's plant, you, you just said it, that he can plant the seed. Plant the seed for what? That the defense would have, could have investigated things and didn't. Or should have and didn't. And that is completely irrelevant. That's impermissible argument. When you say irrelevant, that's, you're it suggesting. Sure, if I may, as the court knows, the rule of relevancy is does it tend to make any fact of circumstance more or less likely, correct? Well, let's put it in, an, in another way. Let's say that if the state did something uh, suggesting, well, the, the, the defendant could have come up on the stand and denied all this. 
Now, why is that not allowed? Not because it wouldn't be a, a persuasive argument in a lot of cases, but because the Constitution says the defendant has that right and the state's not allowed to force him up onto the stand by, um, by uh, challenging the jury to disregard the constitutional privilege and hold the defendant to account for his silence. There's no a collateral uh, right with respect to failure to investigate. You don't have you don't have to investigate, but I think generally the rule is that uh, it's it's lawful for the uh, jury to um, wonder why uh, why uh, something which could have been done sure. wasn't done when you're trying to show the police did a shoddy job. But there is a constitutional right to the presumption of innocence. Right. And for the state to prove beyond a reasonable doubt um, that the things were committed. The presumption of innocence is that he is presumed innocent. He has no obligation to do anything. I agree. So then shifting and saying, they could have done something to imply that they had power to do something is contradictory to that presumption. You didn't have to use the defense that you're using. You could have just said, let them prove it. But the defense that we're using doesn't, we're allowed to present any defense that we want. And the defense that we're using does not then forget and get rid of the constitutional rights afforded to my clients. So that just because the defense is the defense is that law enforcement did not do their job does not mean then that the state can bring in evidence that would be otherwise inadmissible or ask impermissible questions. No. That's, there's no rule that states when you're attacking the police that law enforcement, that the state then gets to shift blame and plant seeds in a juror's mind that the defense could have done something that they didn't do. So Judge, we're, we're in a posture where um, there's an objection the court makes, you know, uh, essentially, I think, makes a ruling, and then uh, counsel, to her credit, in terms of being an aggressive uh, litigator, chooses another uh, try, another try, another try. Um, I, I feel the court has made a ruling and would ask us to be able to proceed. We have a, a number of witnesses. This is a long case, as the court is aware. I think the court's made a decision. I'm, we're ready to proceed. Judge, could I? Be heard briefly. Uh, again, Judge, I, I think the idea of multiple attorneys arguing this after the court has already the jury's out. So, uh, well, uh, out. you know what? You know what? Uh, you're right. That is the usual protocol, and I uh, invariably defer to the reporter because that's why the rule exists: is to protect the reporter from having tried to straighten out who's talking when. So I'm going to allow him a brief response. I don't think I've actually ruled. And yeah, you've been in here enough, you know, that uh, I uh, enjoy a spirited discussion before I, I make up my mind and I sometimes change it. Both, Go ahead. Both are true. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, so really this is more of a exploration of what Attorney Mahler has already said. However, what I think has been left out of this, besides the presumption of innocence, is that um, this whole defense, the criticizing the police conduct, the investigation, all goes to reasonable doubt. And reasonable doubt is just, it's the foundational principle of any trial verdict uh, where, where the burden is squarely on the state. And if the court allows them to then have the state turn around and say, um, uh, well, you know, I guess the burden's ours, but it's not really, it's kind of theirs too. That's the seed we're planting. And so we're kind of eviscerating or at least seriously diluting the reasonable doubt standard if you allow them to do that. Because I guarantee he's gonna try and argue it in, in some form or fashion. That's all I wanted to say, Judge. I understand. Um, the jury, um, 
Well, they're to, while they're to consider only the evidence received at the trial, we also tell them you can use your common sense and your observations and experiences in the affairs of life. Now, the government has the wherewithal. They could have called on 10 times as many police and scientists to be involved in the investigation of this case. Of course, the cost of that would have to be paid for somewhere else. And when the defense uh, rests upon the proposition that the government didn't put enough effort or uh, money into the investigation, uh, the jurors can, uh, can, are not going to be told they can't think, well, you know, there's got to be a limit to this. There's so much, only so much to go around. And what they take out of this case or what they put in extra to this case, they might have to take it out somewhere else. And um, so, when, you know, can they consider that um, if the defense wanted something to be examined, uh, and if they could have done so at either modest or no cost at all, um, I, I don't understand how that's some uh, shifting of the burden for the jurors to try to put some proportionality in this uh, attack on, on the police. Um, well, I'll leave it at that. So I, I think the answer to that is um, that the implication is we would only be testing something to prove our client's innocence, which is a burden on us. It's, it's literally a burden on the defense to come up with something affirmative. And that's just not our, that's just not our system, you know? And, you know, the jurors speculate about a thousand things about, you know, why, why this was done or wasn't done. And um, at, the, at, at the end of the day, uh, they, they have to satisfy them themselves that um, the state has met their burden, not that the the defense has failed in some form or fashion. Well, I agree with you there, and I'm going to tell them that in my instructions. But uh, although I tell the jury that the entire burden of proof is on the state, uh, when I tell them what they can consider, I, t I tell them the evidence in the case. You've been around, I've been around, when a lawyer on either side has tried to present some particular evidence and it's like it's like a torpedo hitting the ship. It's, it has just the opposite effect of what was expected. And sometimes, I've seen it happen, uh, you haven't, uh, be, uh, uh, because it wouldn't have happened in one of your cases, but I've seen cases where uh, the, the uh, I used to have a full head of hair until I heard some of the questions that get asked. Me from, too, Judge. Yeah. I, uh, and I think, why is he asking that? And, uh, and he gets exactly the, uh, the uh, answer that he ought to have foreseen. Uh, and sometimes uh, lawyers go ask five, six questions leading up to it. And I guess the uh, central focus of their entire examination and it bombs like crazy and turns the whole case around. Um, and that, I tell the jury, consider the evidence. That includes when that one lawyer or another lost the case in a single question. Um, but this is, he says it's a one-time thing. He's not going to go on about it. Uh, he's, I, I think your perception that he's going to argue it. Uh, that's exactly my perception. Well, I think that's fair. That's what he said. I am going to do that. 
Sure. As I have and dozens of times and never had an appeal even even rendered on it. Never I've argued this I've argued this dozens of times before courts where the court case was appealed and it's never even been the subject of an appeal. And any argument I've ever made, you know why? Because it's not it's not there is nothing impermissible about it. Otherwise well, maybe, maybe otherwise let me finish. Otherwise appellate counsels would have pounced on this throughout my thirty year career. I have made this argument in this court as well as every court in this county many times. You know why? Because it is it is a valid argument to be made for the reasons that the court has clearly stated. Uh, and I'd ask the court to let us go because we got witnesses. So in my 34 years, I have not seen it done. Maybe Kenosha is different. I've spent some time down here, but maybe not as much as Mr. Gravely. Um, and uh, what I haven't heard is some sort of citation to authority that allows them to do that. I haven't, I, I haven't seen the country, and I, I, but I also don't recall his ever, ever having done it in here. And if he did, if there was no objection, I'd probably just, just left it alone. Uh, but uh, I, can't, I can't tell you. I don't recall it ever happening in here. But uh, I certainly don't doubt him when he said it might have happened in other courts. But still no citation but to authority. That's not a, no, that's correct. But, uh, so I'm maybe gonna, that's, maybe I'm that's going the default. To, if there's no citation to authority, then you don't let him do it. Unless I think he's wrong. Well, I, if I think he's wrong, but I don't think he is. So uh, the objection's over. Okay. okay Would you come down, please? Okay. Thank you. What's that? He's right already. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, again, I uh, apologize for the time. Uh, you're, you're a wonderful jury. You, uh, you've been very, very patient with us, and uh, I, I, the only thing I can tell you is when, he, when we have these, the, uh, these uh, extended discussions down here, uh, it, we're working. We're not uh, telling war stories and stuff like that. So. Uh, so let's continue. Yes, uh, here we go. Cylinder off. Uh, there was an objection, Judge. What is the court's ruling? So the the objection has been overruled. So again, Officer, uh, my question uh, is, uh, to your knowledge, do both sides in this case have an ability to send items to the crime lab if they feel they are worthy or necessary of testing? Yes. I don't have any further questions. Thank you, yes I do. Um, on May 19th, 2020, are, is anyone allowed to come in and process the crime scene? Describe anyone. Um, other than law enforcement? No. So I wouldn't be able to walk in and process the areas that I would want, correct? 
No, uh, it's a crime scene area. It was court off as a crime scene area. Only uh, authorized law enforcement is allowed inside. Okay, so if I wanted to test the Corona bottle that was in the trash, I wouldn't have been able to do that. You wouldn't be inside the scene, no. And if I wanted, oh, it would. She would not be inside the scene, so no. Oh. And if I wanted to test the light switches, I wouldn't have been able to take those swabs, correct? No. And I wouldn't have been able to swab the knives that were found next to the lines and next to that diffuser, correct? Correct. And I wouldn't have been able to test the ginger ale bottle that was in the trash, correct? Correct. Because I would not have access to that crime scene, correct? No, you would not. Only law enforcement had access to that crime scene. Only crime scene investigators, yes. Nothing further. Any question? But uh, for all the items that uh, the defense asked you, whether they were sent on to the crime lab that were collected, no. both parties have an equal opportunity. Objection, as an answer. Uh, this is, if you're asking a legal question. Uh, he has, uh, you're asking him to repeat what, what is in the statutes? No, I, I wasn't. Yes, you are. That's, that's where it comes from. You're asking him not a factual question about what he observed in the at the, at the scene of the event or or um, <coughs> what he heard. You're asking him what is in the law. I, I you wasn't want the jury to know something about the law. Yeah. You ask me, and then I'll tell them. I apologize, Judge. I in no way meant to do that. Can I can I repeat what I believe I said, and and so that it, so that the court can can indicate. You can. Can I, can I ask another question? And, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, hopefully, it won't be in a, okay. a duplicate of that. Okay. So, um, uh, officer, um, only as to those items where, on cross examination, you were asked if items that were taken into evidence could uh, were sent to the crime lab. Okay. Only as to those items. Judge, I'm going to object. Do, let me, can I? No, no because no, it's no, already a mischaracterization. He can finish. Well, he is, you're saying what she said. But, and it's not what I said. The well, items that I listed were not items that were taken into evidence. Well, for instance, the cigarette butts. I did not mention that on cross-examination. Oh, uh, she did. She showed no, several didn't. pictures of cigarette butts. On my recross, I did not mention that. He does right. not get to go back to everything prior. So well, I no, no, I have, I've made pretty clear my adherence to that particular rule. Did, did, Go ahead and finish your question. Did, did, and then, but can I just point out that the argument was first that she didn't say it, and yeah, then that... Why don't you put when you're ahead? I said, go ahead and ask your question. You're right, I should. I apologize. Um, as to the items where you were specifically asked by defense counsel whether you sent them to the crime lab, do both parties have an ability to send items to the crime lab if they feel they are necessary and appropriate? Anything that I collect? And the, you're asking him a question about what the law provides, and that's not for him to say. Instructions about what the law provides come from the judge. Okay, so if you I want me to, I'll read it. I think I understand what the court's saying. Can both sides send those items to the crime line? Not is it appropriate, Objection but can they answer. send? Well, it actually hasn't been answered. Well, kind of, but go ahead, Ann. You can answer it. Now, as to those items referred to, can they be sent to the crime lab by either side? Anything that I collect and put into evidence can be sent to the crime lab. By either side? By either side. Okay. Nothing else? No, Judge, nothing. You may step down. Thank you. Your Honor, State calls Lisa Treppinger to the stand.
do you solemnly swear the testimony that you are about to give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So I'll be God. Thank you. Please be seated. Ms. Treppinger, can you state your first and last name and spell both those names for the record? Lisa Treppinger, L-I-S-A-T-R-E-F-F-I-N-G-E-R. Where are you employed? I'm employed at the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory in Milwaukee. And uh, how long have you been so employed? I've been at the state lab for over 25 years. Can you indicate uh, what uh, the state crime lab does? Um, they receive evidence from outside agencies and they do testing of, upon the evidence, um, write reports on the results and provide testimony in court. And um, when you uh, first began your employment at the uh, state, uh, Wisconsin State Crime Lab, well, I guess, let me ask you this. Are you the primary agency that does the work you just described in the state of Wisconsin? Yes, we have three labs. Okay. Um, and uh, so when you first began your employment at the state crime lab, what was your job there? When I first started, I was in the DNA data bank. And what does that mean? Uh, I worked on samples that came in to be put in the known convicted, uh, the known database. And uh, mechanically, does that mean you operated a machine when you got a sample, or were you a data intake person? What were you mechanically doing in that particular job? Well, back then we didn't have any automated systems, so I was doing it all by hand. Okay, and the data bank you're speaking about, that's a, a collection of DNA results from uh, individuals for various reasons uh, in the state of Wisconsin? Correct. It's um, known individuals and then casework samples and quality assurance samples. And uh, how long did you uh, have that particular job at the crime lab? I did that for about three years. And so what date are we at now in terms of three years in? We're about 2000. Okay. In the year 2000, uh, did you continue your work with the state crime lab? Yes, I did. What did you do then? Then I became a forensic scientist in the DNA database and the DNA unit. Okay. Um, and what is a forensic scientist within the within the state crime lab? Uh, so in this case, I worked in the DNA section, and I worked on evidence that was uh, brought into the section um, to do testing on it, write reports, make comparisons testify in court. And uh, how long did you do that particular job? So in other words, where your primary job was, it, it, it is, is an accurate way to call that job a DNA analyst? Yes. Okay, so as a DNA analyst, how long was that your primary job? From 2000 to about 2022. <laughs> Before we go any further, so wait, 2000 to 2022, 22 years? Yes. Okay. Um, before we go any further, uh, what type of education did you receive to be employed at the state crime lab, uh, particularly as a forensic scientist or DNA analyst? I have a Bachelor of Science degree from Mount Mary College. I majored in biology and I minored in history. I have coursework in molecular biology, biochemistry, genetics, and statistics. Before you become a DNA analyst, after having received that education, is there a training or apprenticeship type period that you also are involved in early in your employment? Yes, when you start at the lab um, in the DNA analysis section, it's about a three-year training process that you go through. It involves um, lectures, tests, written and oral, mock cases, proficiency tests. And are you also being employed as an analyst during that three-year period, or, or is that before you even become a, a formal analyst? That's when you start your analyst um, duties. Okay. Um, and um, for you, did you go through that full three-year period? Yes, I did. It was maybe a little bit uh, brief because I had already been in the data bank, so I had already learned some of that. And my previous employment, I had already had DNA experience. What was the previous employment that caused you to have DNA experience? I worked at the uh, Blood Center of Southeastern Wisconsin, where I did DNA analysis on uh, paternity cases. So um, after 2022, well, let me just ask you, in, uh, in 2020, 
did you have occasion in the capacity with your work uh, as a DNA analyst to be involved in a case uh, where you were attempting to uh, assist the Kenosha Police Department in analyzing evidence where the case name for your lab was uh, Rosalio Gutierrez Jr. Yes, I did. And were you the primary analyst during the year 2020 and 2021 as any evidence came into the crime lab on that case? Yes, for DNA I was the primary. Okay. Would that be the way the lab usually works, where they would assign one person, there'd be a primary for as long as that person continued in that particular employment? Yes, they may have people assist them, but there's usually a primary one person that writes the lab, uh, the report in the lab. And at some point during those two years then, did you uh, get a variety of evidence at times, and were you uh, asked to do a DNA analysis of that evidence? Yes, I was. And uh, before I go further, uh, during that period of time, 2020 and 2021, what, what was in place at the crime lab to try to assist you in making sure that whatever your conclusions were in terms of science were accurate? Um, our lab is accredited. Um, we have standard operating procedures that we follow. And so what are the standard operating procedures that you, that you can uh, think of that, again, uh, ensure uh, accuracy in the results when you are the analyst during that period? So during that time, uh, we have a, a standard operating procedure manual that we follow. Um, part of that is once we complete our analysis and write our report, Another, analysis, another analyst goes through your report and your findings and come, makes sure that you follow the procedure and that that analyst would come up with the same results that you and conclusions that you have. And what is that uh, process called? Or what, is there a phrase that describes that process uh, that is a requirement at the crime lab? Yes, all our cases go through a pure technical review. Okay. And again, if I understand, that's a second analyst checking your work, making sure they have the same result. That's correct. Um, now, mechanically, when you take in evidence and you're testing for DNA, can you describe for the jury the, the, what, what mechanically you do? Are you, are you in a lab? Uh, is it a machine you're working? What are you doing that causes you to get a result? Uh, so you receive the evidence and it's packaged. Um, so then you take notes on what you receive and what you see. Um, you may go through some screening tests. Um, then you go through an extraction of, of what you get. Um, you do a quantita quantitation of how much sample that you have. Um, you amplify it, uh, like making Xerox copies of what you have. Uh, then you run it through an analyzer, and then you get the data. You take that data, and you compare that to any standards that you may have. Um, and then you write the report, and then it goes through the peer um, review. It goes through an administrative review, and and it goes out to the agencies. And uh, Ms. Treppiger, in, uh, in the case of 2020-2021, uh, is that the exact process that you utilized in processing any evidence uh, from Kenosha indicating uh, Rosalio Gutierrez, Jr.? Yes, that was my process. Uh, since 2022, uh, have you uh, changed jobs within the state crime line? Yes, I have. Okay, and so what is the job, uh, what was the next job you took on? Uh, the next job, I became a specialist in the crime scene response unit. And uh, how long did you do that? Uh, I did that for about a year. Okay, and so uh, now, are you still employed at the, crime, at the crime lab? Yes, I am. And so what do you do for the lab now? Now, in January, I took a position in the quality assurance program as a specialist. Um, and so, at, at this moment, are you still doing any DNA analysis? No, I'm not. I do not work on the bench at this point. At, that's what you call it? The bench? The bench. Okay. And at this moment, do you have a job where you go to crime scenes, crime scene response uh, specialists? No, I do not go to crime scenes anymore. Okay. When you were a crime scene response specialist, was one of your duties to be sent around the state to crime scenes? Yes, it was. Have you, in fact, come to Kenosha in that capacity in the year 2022 on occasion? Yes, I have. And before you took on that job uh, of a crime scene response specialist, did you also uh, uh, go to crime scenes or assist in working crime scenes while you were a DNA analyst uh, on many occasions? 
Yes, I, that was one of my additional duties, and I did that um, for about 10 years. So s starting approximately when? 2012, 2013. So for, if I understand you right, from 2012 or 13 to 2022, you were one of the people the state crime lab sent out uh, when the state was requested to be of assistance at crime scenes. Yes, that's correct. And um, why does the state crime lab get called to assist at, at certain crime scenes, if you know? Um, we assist the agencies, uh, maybe smaller agencies don't have the resources or the technology that we do. Uh, maybe larger agencies are, they're so spread out they just could need some help. They're looking for technical assistance in these cases. And have you received formalized training in uh, the uh, uh, processing of or the working through a crime scene as part of the duties you had for those 10 years? Yes, I have. And so in general, what was the formalized training you had to allow you to be uh, qualified in some fashion to assist and work those crime scenes? Uh, I took some online courses. I also went through our training program that we have at the lab. I attended evidence technician school that uh, the state puts on. I also attended um, death investigation school uh, that the state puts on. Um, I've also attended different uh, courses uh, for blood stain pattern analysis, for trajectory. Um, I've attended conferences um, in regards to those things related to crime scene. Uh, so, Ms. Treppinger, uh, in terms of your arrival at crime scenes and working crime scenes from 2012 to 2022, when that was one of your duties at the crime, at the crime lab, how many times would you estimate you went to some other location in the capacity of the crime lab and were part of uh, evidence collection and analysis uh, at, uh, uh, in relation to a crime scene? I've probably been to over 100 scenes in those years. And uh, is that always a team approach from the crime lab, multiple people go? Yes, we always send multiple people. Okay, so uh, there's photography that's sometimes done in those locations? Yes, that's correct. Is that something you do or is that not a specialty of yours? No, I'm not a photographer, I'm a team leader. Okay. So when you say you were a leader, uh, when did you become a, a team leader of the crime scene uh, uh, team that goes out uh, from the state crime line? So that was when I finished my training and I was probably signed off about 2014. And so how many of the scenes, you said approximately 100 scenes, of those, how many of them do you believe you were probably team leader? What's your estimate? at least uh, more than half of those. Um, when you go out, you're not always the team lead um, because we send multiple people. So. During your time period from say 2017 to 2020, now let's just talk about this time period. During the time period of 2020 and 2021, uh, how, were you, uh, how were you ranked in terms of the amount of experience of individuals at the crime lab who were specifically being sent to crime scenes? Were you one of the most experienced, one of the least experienced? Where were you? Um, so at, at those years, we had three team leaders at the lab, and uh, I was probably the second most experienced. There was one other team leader that was came after me. I take that back. There was another one. So there was four of us. So the two others were after me. So you believe you were the second most experienced team leader in the state? No, at our lab. Okay. In the Milwaukee crime lab? Correct. Okay. At the time that, so, so, in uh, the Kenosha case, Rosalio Gutierrez Jr. Um, was some of your work uh, taking samples that had been provided by other parties and doing analysis on those? Was that part of what you did? Correct. 
the evidence was brought in, and then I worked it from there. Okay, so that's one of the ways you might be employed at the crime lab during this period, is that right? That's correct. But you say you were a crime scene uh, investigator as well, so there, that, does that mean at times you are collecting the evidence as well? Yes, during that time I did go to scenes and collected evidence as well. And uh, in this particular case, Rosalio Gutierrez, was there a point where you used your experience and techniques to collect evidence yourself as opposed to being dependent on a, some other agency to collect it? Um, there was evidence that, uh, that was brought to the, to the lab that I looked at and helped determine to collection of it. So that, that's a different role than just taking in samples that you know somebody else has determined that was were, were worthy, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and, and the reason you're able to do that is because of the other crime scene experience work that you had done over the years, correct? That's correct. Okay. And, it, and did were there other people on your crime response team who you utilized or who were part of your review of some of the evidence in this case for the same reasons? That is correct. Yes. Okay. So that said, you were not at any scene in Kenosha contemporaneous with May of 2020, right? You did not come to a bloody scene or anything else in Kenosha? No, I did not. Okay. At the time that you did analysis in the case Rosalio Gutierrez, so I'm now directing you to sometime around uh, May of 2020, uh, how many times do you estimate that you had done DNA analysis where you were taking an item and trying to figure out if you could match it to someone's, to someone's DNA sample or control sample? Thousands of times. Okay. And th that would be thousands of times over that entire uh, career uh, that you have talked about. That's correct. Now, can you indicate briefly to the jury whether you have a working knowledge of what the source of DNA would be from a human body? In other words, what, what are the types of places or things on our body that might give DNA so that a person like you could test and match it? So um, DNA is found in nucleated cells, and that can be found in blood, semen, vaginal secretions, hair, saliva, skin cells. So those would be the sources? Those are the, the sources we use, yes. Okay. And um, some, of the item, some of the sources that you talked about have particular physical appearances? Yes. Some of them are, uh, are, are almost uh, indetectable uh, to the human eye, and depending on what quantity they're in? That's correct. Okay. And uh, as a crime scene analyst from crime scenes, are you familiar with the appearances of those sources of DNA deposited at crime scenes over your long career? Yes, I have seen those. Okay. Uh, and then when you do results in the lab, are you also able sometimes to formulate an idea based on uh, whatever available evidence there is about what the source is of those ones that you named? Uh, yes, you can get a general idea of what they are. Okay. And I'm going to ask you if, uh, as to any opinion you offer as to what the source of any DNA that we talk about would be, okay, and if we talk about whether you reach any conclusion that something is a match, whether you would please adopt the standard of to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. Would you do that with me? Yes. If, so if you offer an opinion, would you only offer an opinion if you feel it meets that standard to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Can you agree to do that? Yes. Okay. Rather than me ask you each time, are you reaching that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Give me no opinion that does not meet that standard. Can we agree on that? Yes. Okay. So um, were you, um, I, I want to start by the, ish, the items that were submitted to you um, by uh, other uh, sources. Um, 
So um, were you sent uh, some, uh, let, me, let me start with toothbrushes. Um, let me do this first. Uh, I guess, Judge, I'm going to object as far as leading from her report. I think the more efficient and better way to do it is to provide the analyst her report and ask what she received. Uh, I, I, I'll leave it in his hands. I'll answer. Uh, I like your suggestion. I'll move quick. So I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 39. Ask you if you recognize this document. Yes, I do recognize this document. And is this a document you prepared? Yes, it is. Is uh, And uh, is it a true and accurate copy of the report you prepared in your capacity uh, at the crime lab as a DNA analyst uh, that you have testified to already today? Yes, it is. Does it appear to be altered or changed in any way from the document you originally prepared? Other than a sticker being on it. Nope, it does not. OK. Um, uh, Judge, I'd move admission of the exhibit. Objection. No objection. What's the number on it, please? S-39. 39, thank you. As uh, we uh, talk about this, um, does exhibit 39 uh, indicate some toothbrush, uh, toothbrushes were sent to you? That is correct. And did you analyze those? Yes, I did. And uh, did you um, uh, come uh, and, and so were those something that you looked at for, for instance, DNA? Yes. Um, did you uh, also um, analyze um, uh, item G, hair collected from a sofa seat cushion? Yes, I did. And H, hair reportedly collected from a sofa pillow? Yes, I did. Okay. So let's briefly go through each item. As to the toothbrushes, C through F, what findings, if any, did you make uh, that would be relevant to us? Uh, there was a single source uh, profile from item D, toothbrush. OK. Item C yep. uh, was a single source item from a toothbrush. OK. Uh, item E. Uh, was a single source profile from a toothbrush, and item F uh, was a mixture from a toothbrush. Okay. Does mixture mean you couldn't uh, make a DNA analysis or a comparison? Yes, because it is a mixture, then we don't use it for a standard. Okay. Uh, and E1, uh, what, what was your result in terms of the sex of the individual? Uh, for item E1 toothbrush, uh, the source was female. And uh, are, are you for any reason aware that uh, Rosalia Gutierrez has a daughter? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Um, and, what, and were you aware she was a minor? She's, she's a child? Yes, I think I knew that. Okay. Um, as to C1, uh, did you identify a single source male? Yes, I did. And without stating the name, uh, did that uh, come back to an individual who you believe to be a son of uh, Rosalio uh, Gutierrez? Yes, it did. Okay. And again, that's a child, correct? Correct. And then as to D1, uh, that, what was your result in terms of how many source profiles there were? D1 was a single source profile. Okay. And were you able ultimately uh, through investigative means to determine that uh, that uh, single source profile uh, uh, what came back uh, or was a match to uh, a person identified to you as Rosalio Gutierrez, Jr.? Yes, it was. Okay. Now I want to turn your attention to uh, uh, hair samples uh, from the living room. Do you identify those as K1A, K2A, and K3A? Yes, I do. Okay. 
And uh, those are uh, three separate hair samples, to your knowledge? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked as State Exhibit 97 and ask you if that has K1A, K2A, K3A in it uh, based on the package. Yes, based on the packaging, it does have K1, K2, K3 in it. Okay, so very briefly, because I don't think the jury's heard this, uh, can you describe why, just based on the packaging without opening it, you have some degree of confidence that it's the right item. So what are you doing in terms of the packaging or labeling that allows you to, to uh, be able to say that? So when I receive a piece of uh, item of evidence, um, I initial and date it. Um, and I have done that on all the barcodes uh, that were placed on here. Um, I also initial and date the seal. I also make a note uh, the date um, that I open something and I uh, initial it as well. And um, as to uh, this exhibit, uh, were you able to, how many sources were there in your profile and what was the sex, if you can recall? Um, so from this, there was uh, three hairs that I tested and three hairs that I got profiles from. And all three hairs were single source profiles um, and they were um, Razio, Razelio Gutierrez was the source. Okay. so. Again, the same person who was uh, uh, on the toothbrush uh, earlier in D1 is the source of those of all three of those hairs. Do I have that correct? Yes, you do. Uh, did you also uh, take uh, possession of and do testing on something identified to you as swab from a main doorknob, item W1 or W? Yes, I did. And uh, were you able uh, on that item to determine how many sources and whether it was a male or female? Yes, I was. What was your determination? Uh, it was a single source male profile. Does exhibit 80, I'm sorry, I should have showed it to you, counsel. Exhibit 80 um, appear to be the item uh, that we've spoken about thus far? Yes, it does. And what, if any, source could you identify as to uh, this particular item, again, a uh, Uh, a swab from the main doorknob. It was a single source male profile and the source was Rosalio Gutierrez. Okay, and can you tell me, was that, um, was that particular swab uh, a, uh, what is called a touch DNA swab or was that blood, if you know? Uh, I believe this was a touch DNA swab. Okay, um, and so as to that doorknob, uh, only one person was on it and it was uh, Rosalio Gutierrez Jr., correct? That is correct. Okay. And then uh, was there also a swab that was uh, provided to you where it was labeled for you a swab from the interior patio door handle? Yes. Okay. And um, at that, uh, for that swab, um, did you, how many people did you get in the mixture? This is item X1. I apologize. Um, X1 was a four-person mixture. And so there was some traces of four-person's DNA in your uh, findings, is that correct? That is correct. Could you identify the sex of any of those four? Uh, yes, I could. And what was the sex you identified? Uh, there was at least one male in the profile. And uh, is there something called a major contributor as well as minor contributors? Is that a thing in this business? Yes, it is. And what does that mean? A uh, major contributor is someone that stands out as to having the most DNA in the mixture. Is that uh, often in the touch DNA world, uh, the person who touches something the most? It could be. It's the, the person who left the most DNA there. 
Okay. Uh, so, uh, sometimes the last person who touches an item. Yes, it would be the last person. Okay. And uh, so, uh, as uh, and and if a person uh, touches an, uh, a surface um, with gloves on, would you expect to find any results for them in a swab of uh, the item that they touch? Usually, you don't if someone has worn a glove. So, um, were you able to get a major? male contributor in this particular item X1? Yes, I was. All right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 81. Again, this is a swab from the interior patio door handle. That's how it's identified to you. As to Exhibit 81, um, does this appear to be the same uh, item uh, that you are talking about based on its labeling that you tested uh, and that you are reaching any conclusion that you are regarding? Yes, that does. Okay, so as to that exhibit, uh, who is the major male contributor based on your findings? For item X1, the major is Razielio Gutierrez. And uh, as to those minor profiles, you mentioned three other people. Uh, what can you tell us about, uh, about those three? I, I can't say anything about the minor contributors. Um, there's just not enough to make any conclusions. Uh, is that uncommon in the touch DNA world? No, that's not. Was there a um, sample or, some, or something for testing? Uh, and, and, and again, as to X1, that item we just talked about, was that, uh, can you indicate what the source of DNA was? In other words, skin, semen, all those possibilities you gave. What, what kind of DNA is that one, if you know? Um, given that it's a swab from a handle, I would say that it was touch DNA, most likely skin cells. So now uh, I'm going to ask you about item Y1. Uh, identified as swabs uh, of the pool of blood. Uh, is that, would that be blood as the source in that particular uh, uh, item? Yes, it would. And uh, were you able to get any uh, result in, uh, in that one, Adam Y one? Yes, I was. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 79. Ask you as to this item, uh, do you, uh, can you tell, is this packaging consistent with the item uh, that you have just described that you uh, conducted uh, testing on or analysis on for DNA? Yes, it is. And as to that exhibit, uh, were, you, uh, were you able to find out uh, uh, the number of sources and, and the sex of the individual who was any source? Uh, it was a single source male profile. And uh, what, if anything, can you do in terms of uh, results as to who that male profile is? Um, the source was Rosalio Gutierrez. Okay, and that's blood, is that right? That is correct. Okay. Uh, did you at some point uh, swab, uh, look at swabs from a cell phone identified as item Z1? Yes, I did. And uh, do you recall whether Z1 uh, was blood or skin cells or you know, what the source of that particular swab was, if you recall? I believe that was um, touch a swab of the cell phone, so this is skin cells. Okay, and as to that uh, item um, identified as Z1, were you able to identify male or female, and how many sources? A single source male profile. Okay, and this is touch DNA again? Correct. I'm going to show you what's been marked as Exhibit 91, and ask you as to that item, is this uh, packaging consistent? with the uh, item you just testified that you were involved in analyzing for DNA. Yes, it is. And uh, what, if any, result did you get regarding that item? Item Z, um, it was a single source male profile, um, and the source was Rosalio Gutierrez. And again, that you believe that to be skin cells based on uh, what, uh, you, uh, what you tested, correct? That is correct. Um, did you um, also test uh, uh, something identified as swabs of a stain from that same cell phone? Yes, I did. And is that, was that item uh, uh, described by you as uh, AA1? Yes, it was. Uh, and that's a crime lab number, is that correct? Yes. You, you uh, determine that number for purposes of being able to keep these things organized, separated, etc.? Correct. And uh, as to that item, uh, did you do testing? Yes, I did. And was that, what was the source of that? Could you recognize whether that was 
a swab uh, based on uh, your ability to determine was it uh, skin cells or semen or what was it from? Um, in that case, the swab, we did do some screening tests on it and we confirmed that AA was from blood. So uh, when would you do a screen, uh, when you say screening test, what, what does that mean? A screening test is something you can do that gives you an indication of what it is and the, um, that's an indication and then you can do a confirmatory test which confirms that it is blood. So there's uh, some chemical way to do that, is that correct? That's correct. Are you able to do that in every single circumstance where you have blood? No, we are not. And so what are the limitations? Why are you sometimes able to do that kind of uh, chemical testing and sometimes not? It depends on the amount, uh, the sample size. If you, if you have a lot, you, you can do that. If you only have a, a minor amount of blood, you save it for the DNA analysis. Okay. And when you say a lot, you're, it's relative to your profession, right? For us, it would not be a lot or a little, right? It, yeah. Okay. If, if you have a swab with a stain on it, that's a good amount. Okay. So in this case, you had, in, in your professional estimate, sufficient amount to do some additional chemical testing. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Uh, and if you don't have that amount, uh, does that mean that a person from the crime lab would never be able to make a determination about whether something was blood or simply do you, do you, have, do you not have one of the tools available that you would use uh, in other occasions? Right, we wouldn't do an analysis, so we wouldn't say um, confirmatory, um, but we would have an opinion that we would use. So in this case, you can't use the chemicals that you would, no, that you would assist yourself on if you had enough uh, of a quantity. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So uh, I'm going to ask you as to exhibit uh, 90, is this uh, the uh, swab from the stain of the cell phone uh, that we just talked about? Yes, it is. So again, you list that as AA1? Correct. And uh, what were your findings uh, regarding that when you tested it? A single source male profile. And who was the source of that, if you could tell? Rosalio Gutierrez. Now, at some point, were you asked to take a look at swabs from something called, identified as a tractor gear shift? Yes, I was. And were you able to get any uh, uh, profile of any of the people that were included uh, for you to take a look at in this case? No, I was not. Okay, and one of the people included was a person identified as Zachariah Anderson, right? That is correct. So as to the tractor, tractor gear shift, the swab did not have DNA uh, that uh, included uh, that person, is that right? That is correct. And then a swab was taken from a tractor steering wheel as, as well, uh, is that item AD1? That is. And uh, again, uh, is that one where uh, everyone from Rosalio Gutierrez to Zachary Anderson are excluded? They're not uh, the source of any DNA you saw on that tractor steering wheel, is that right? That is correct. At some point, was there a straight razor that was submitted to you? Yes, there was. And was Rosalio Gutierrez, as well as Zachary Anderson, uh, excluded on that? Yes, they were. Now, um, were you also provided a swab from a stain from a piece of wood? Yes, I was. And was that identified as item A01? That is correct. And uh, were you able to test that item? Yes, I was. Uh, and uh, first of all, were you able to determine uh, what uh, that was in terms of skin cells or blood or semen or any of the others? Yes, I was. And how were you able to do that? Uh, I was able to confirm that it was blood. And how were you able to confirm that? Uh, we do a uh, hematrace test. Okay. And is that one of the tests you do if you have enough of a, a quantity? That's correct. Okay. Uh, so in this case, again, you had a sufficient quantity of the blood to be able to do a sample to determine if it's blood. That's correct. Uh, in uh, that situation, uh, I'm going to show you uh, Exhibit 98 and ask you as to the swab uh, from the piece of wood. Um, is that Exhibit 98? Uh, an exhibit that is the packaging of the testing you perform. Yes, it is. And uh, what was the result on the swab from the blood from the piece of wood uh, that was uh, handed over to you? It was a single source male profile. And what? Uh, who was the source of that, if you know? Rosalio Gutierrez. Now,
finding uh, from this March 29th report in a minute, but first I, I'd like to First, I'd like to ask you if you recognize Exhibit uh, 38. If so, could you tell me what that is? Item 38 is a report that I wrote on May 7th of 2021. And when did you perform any testing that is memorialized in that uh, exhibit? I'd have to look it back at, at, at my notes, but it would have been before May 7th of 2021. And um, did this uh, involve a couple of additional items that you were asked to uh, perform a, an identical analysis of? In other words, looking for a DNA uh, and trying to figure out the source? Yes, I was. Okay, so in terms of the process or, or the fact that it was submitted, it was just submitted at a different time? That's correct. Okay, so uh, was uh, one of the items in the May 7th, uh, let me ask you, as to that May 7th report, does it appear to be a true and accurate copy uh, or uh, report of your findings uh, regarding uh, testing a couple of items and then reporting it May 7th, 2021? Yes, it does. And is it, uh, is it changed or altered in any way other than the fact that there's a sticker on it with a number that you can see? No, it's not. I'd move admission of that report as an exhibit, Your Honor. No objection. No objection. Proceed. So I'd like to turn your attention then to a swab from the, uh, something called swab from the exterior door center. Do you uh, see that uh, listed as uh, AR1 and AR2? Yes, I do. And uh, when uh, that uh, came to you, that was in the form of a swab? Yes, it was. And uh, can you tell me uh, what uh, that appeared to be uh, sourced from? Was that hair? Was that saliva, uh, semen, something else? Uh, it was identified as blood. And uh, did you do any additional testing to determine it was blood? Yes, I did. And what was your finding? That, that it was blood, yes. Okay. And then as to that exhibit, uh, were you able to make findings about uh, who the source of that was? Yes, I was. Okay. I'm going to show you then what's been marked as States Exhibit 87 and ask as to Exhibit 87 uh, if this is familiar to you in the context of what we just talked about. Yes, it is. What is that? Uh, item AR. And uh, so that is, again, the uh, item that uh, is described as a swabs from the exterior door center. That is correct. And uh, what, if any, uh, finding were you able to make as to uh, AR? Uh, AR was a single source male profile. And who was that? That was from Rosalio Gutierrez. Same person as the other uh, matches that we've talked about in your earlier report? That is correct. Then uh, did you also take swabs from the exterior door frame? Yes, I was able to work uh, swabs from the exterior door frame. And uh, what was the source of those items, if you recall? Uh, it was a single source male profile. Uh, and do you know what the source or type of uh, transmitter of DNA that was? Was that semen, saliva, those other things? And it was blood as well. How do you know that? Uh, I did a confirm confirmatory test on that. So again, for both of these, you had a sufficient amount of the substance to be able to do a chemical testing as to, to help form an opinion, correct? That is correct. Um, as to uh, AS1 and AS2 swabs from exterior door frame, were you able to make findings in terms of uh, whether there was a person who you could identify as a source? Yes, I did. Okay, so I'm going to show you exhibit 85, which again are the the swabs uh, from that uh, exterior door frame. As to exhibit 85, do you recognize what that is in terms of packaging based on what you testified to just moments ago? Yes, I have. And so uh, is that, uh, in fact, uh, the same AS uh, that you just talked about, swabs submitted to you from the exterior door frame per the labeling? Yes, it is. What is your finding uh, in terms of the result of your testing 
regarding who the source is uh, of uh, the blood uh, on that item? Uh, Rosalio Gutierrez is the source. Uh, as to your May 7th uh, report, uh, if, do you recall who requested um, that those additional items be sent to the crime lab? If you do. No, I don't recall. Okay. Um, then uh, I want to return back to the time period of around uh, May of 2020 um, uh, and uh, ask you if there was a time when you uh, were involved in some work uh, on a vehicle uh, that was that was transported to the crime lab. Yes, I did look at a vehicle. And do you recall uh, when you uh, uh, were involved in looking physically at that vehicle and making any findings that you had? Uh, I went out to the garage. I believe it was on May twenty first. Uh, May twenty first of two thousand twenty. That's correct. And when you say the garage, what what are you talking about? So in our laboratory, we have three bays that we refer to as the garage, where we're able to work on vehicles. And um, that uh, would be the standard place you would uh, try to analyze a vehicle? Yeah. Is it, yes. It's enclosed? It's enclosed, yes. And uh, why would you care if uh, you worked in an enclosed space as opposed to out in the open? Uh, well, we want it to be secured. We want to try to control it. We don't want it to be affected by the elements of, of the weather, sunlight, rain. Things like that. So let me ask you that. Uh, does rain impact an ability uh, to uh, find uh, uh, DNA evidence uh, or uh, blood evidence uh, if it impact if rain impacts any surface uh, where there otherwise might uh, be blood? So the rain could potentially wash it away or dilute the blood. So uh, you don't want. Uh, a vehicle you're going to work on, even if you're just going to work on the interior, you don't want any part of it to be exposed to the rain because you're worried that'll compromise an ability to look at DNA? Yes, you, you would prefer it to be protected and, and secured. So uh, at uh, the point that in May, uh, when you were looking at this in the garage, were you being assisted by anybody else? At that point, I was actually assisting someone else. Um, oh. That analyst was assigned to process the vehicle. And so when you say they were assigned to process the vehicle, what's that person supposed to physically be doing in that role at the crime lab at that time? Um, so that analyst is looking over um, the vehicle. Um, they're taking notes, they're taking photographs of it, they're documenting, um, they're doing screening tests, they're collecting evident, any evidence that they deem as probative. And uh, did that take place? Were you present for, for what you believe to be the, the uh, overwhelming majority of that process as it was going on with this other analyst? Um, I was kind of in and out whenever oh. she asked me to look at something. I would go there. I didn't, I didn't stand with her the whole time, no. So you were, you were sort of a consultant? Yes, I was. OK. Uh, and uh, what about any photography that occurred in that process? Who was in charge of that? Um, I did not do any photography. She may have, or another analyst at the lab may have done the photography. So uh, I'm going to show you, uh, first of all, what's been marked as state's exhibit number one, uh, photo 311. So uh, again, this is exhibit one, photo 311. Uh, looking at that, do you recognize uh, the interior of uh, some kind of structure that it seems like the vehicle is in in this situation? Yes, I do. Okay, what is the, what's the building we're in or the structure we're in? We're in the garage at the lab, it's the center bay. Okay, and is uh, this in fact uh, the, uh, uh, a photograph of uh, what the scene looked like when you were being brought in as a consultant on this case? Yes, it was. Uh, is this the van uh, that you uh, 
were involved in and reporting uh, in the first uh, crime uh, lab report we talked about, uh, March 29, 2021? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, you, it's identified as a Dodge Caravan in your report. Is that uh, what you believe it to be? Yes. Okay. And is the condition of the Dodge Caravan as you see it in this picture, uh, the way as the way you saw it in this uh, consultation? In other words, uh, with the carpet out of it, uh, doors open, those kind of things? Yes, yes it was. Okay. And um, it wasn't your job to, with a fine tooth comb, look at every area, right? You were just being brought in on occasion? That is correct. Okay. Um, and so um, when you were uh, being brought in, at some point were you consulted uh, about a, uh, uh, an item uh, that was uh, uh, on the driver's side, which you ultimately identified as A2, a swab with a stain. I'm talking about now the driver's side. Uh, yes, I, I think I, I, I think that we did discuss that, yes. Okay, and what do you recall being the thing you were being asked to consult on as to A2? And uh, if, if I gave you a, a pointer, would you be able to give me an approximate location of A2 on this or not really? Not really. Okay, was it in the back section of this, uh, of this van? Um... Yeah, it, it was in the back section. It was in the cargo area. Okay, so without knowing exactly where, wh what was the what was it you were being asked to consult on on A two? Um, if if it had the right coloring, would it be potential to be a stain? Should it be collected? Okay, and uh, was there a chemical compound uh, being utilized? to uh, do some assistance in detecting whether there was anything of evidentiary value as part of the process that you were being consulted on? Uh, yes, the, the analyst was doing some uh, luminol, and I'm not sure if she had done this before or after, uh, but uh, luminol is what she was going to do or had done. And was there a result regarding luminol on A2 that at least caused you, the two of you to feel like a consultation was appropriate? I can't remember if the luminol was done on that one or if it was just more a, a color that we saw and we collected. Okay, in general, what is luminol? So luminol is a, uh, a liquid that's sprayed over surfaces and it gives you an indication if there is blood, but it also reacts with other things as well. Uh, like cleaning agents? Yes, like cleaning agents, rust. And so you don't recall if there was some indicating using luminol that would cause you two to want to discuss this. That, that's not, you don't remember one way or another? Yeah, I did, I, so I didn't perform the luminol um, and I didn't write the report on it. Okay, who were you discussing? Just so the jury knows if that person shows up later. Uh, that would be uh, Julie Avila. She's a specialist in the crime scene response unit. Okay, so she had uh, a job that was uh, making interpretations at crime scenes much like you did in terms of helping determine what might be of evidentiary value. Correct, she is also a team lead, yes. Okay. Now, uh, at some point, uh, did uh, you guys uh, take a, a swab uh, of a, uh, a stain or an item in that back, uh, in that rear cargo portion based on the consultation we've spoken about? Uh, referring to on the driver's side? A2, yes. A2. Yes, there was a swab that was collected and that I did work. And uh, what was the determination of that? Um, so A2, uh, again, there was not um, there was not blood detected on that. Okay, and uh, so that wasn't blood at all? No. Okay, and was there anything about that when you observed it where you said to yourself, oh, that's blood? Did, did, were, were you... At, did you have that opinion at the time? No, I, I think what I recall is saying it has possibilities. You should probably be collected and we'll try to see what we can get. Okay, and you found it wasn't blood? No, it was not. All right, um, then uh, was there another place that you uh, talked about uh, identified as uh, A1? Yes, there was. Okay, so I'm now gonna show you, uh, again, uh, from exhibit one, uh, photo 313. And uh, is there a sticker there that uh, 
was uh, only there because the state crime lab decided to place it there to, to mark something that they thought was of interest. That is correct, yes. Okay, I'm going to ask that the judge give you a, uh, a pointer and the microphone. Old school pointer, uh, Ms. Treppinger. So if you could just point out where the sticker is uh, that is of interest uh, uh, so the jury can be oriented as to where we're talking about. If you can see it, it's like right, right there. Okay, so really all you can tell in this picture is a sticker showing you a location, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, but you recall that being the location that was of interest? Yes, that uh, was the location. Okay, and, and do you remember how you came to be consulted on that particular item. Again, only if you remember the, the specifics. Uh, yes. So, uh, Alice Avila asked me to call to the garage. She said, I saw something. I, is that on? If it is, you need it a little closer to your, okay. Can you hear me? Now I can. Okay. Uh, Alice Avila called me out to the garage, uh, asked me to look at this. She said, I saw it. It's about at my eye, eye height. I'm a bit taller than she is. So that's why I remember it. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, that, that's the right coloring. I, I think we need to collect that on one swap. And uh, were you concerned about the quantity in terms of uh, decisions you uh, made at that time? Yes, it was a very it, a tiny speck, like a pinhead dot uh, of a dark stain. And um, so uh, now I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked as uh, Exhibit 1, photo 314. Are we a little closer in on this picture? Yes, yes, okay. yes we are. Okay, and again, can you just point for the jury, uh, you probably still can't, you're probably still not quite big enough to see, but uh, is it under that little sticker? Yeah, it's like right about there. Okay, um, and um, at, at that point, was a decision made, you said it should be collected, correct? Yes, I said Was that. luminol put on it? No. Why not? No, I didn't, I said do not luminol this um, because it's a spray, it's a liquid, it will dilute it, and you want to collect everything that's possible that's there. And uh, now I'm going to show you uh, exhibit one, uh, and that this is number 315. Is that a picture where you can actually now, at this uh, uh, illumination or, or uh, uh, increase of size, I'm, miss, I'm, losing, I have, I'm not coming up with the word, at this uh, size are you able to now see the spec uh, visible in this uh, exhibit? So yeah, the, the previous uh, photographs would be called overalls. This would be what we would call a close-up. And at this close-up photography, you can see the same right there. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I did say 315. Yeah. Um, and uh, are you able to see any characteristics of it once you get it uh, uh, enhanced in terms of its size? Uh, yeah, you can kind of tell that it's a, it's a, a reddish-brown stain at that, on that photograph. Okay. And is there a shape or anything else to it that uh, was of any significance to you at, uh, uh, at any point? It was more like, a, it was a shape that maybe uh, round, circular, more like a, something that you see that would be like a splash or a spray. So uh, you can go back to your seat, thank you. And uh, you could use our normal microphone, thank you very much. Um, so uh, are you the person are you the person then who took the swab, or is Miss Avila the person who did that? Uh, Julie was the one that actually collected the swab, and then she packaged it up and sealed it. Okay, and then it, and then at that point, ultimately, you've seen it in person, correct? Correct. You've seen it in context. You know where it's located. You know its characteristics by uh, being able to look at it and even enhanced, right? Correct. Okay, and now you are going to do a anal an analysis of it, I assume. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Using the usual machinery and methods as best you can, correct? That is correct, yes. All right. So um, you have told us previously on other samples that you did a chemical test for blood in multiple other samples. Do you recall that in your testimony? Yes, I do. Did you do that as to A1? No, I did not. Okay. So why? Why, why didn't you, if, if you thought this might be blood, why didn't you do it on this sample? This sample was so small, I'm, I'm like a pinhead size. Um, so again, I just wanted to use every amount that we had available uh, for testing. 
for the genetic testing. I'm going to go back for a second to uh, number uh, 311, exhibit 1311. Did you, uh, I, and I know you weren't the primary person, but did you overall take a look at this uh, vehicle in terms of the back of it? Uh, yeah, I, I did. I looked around the vehicle, I looked inside the vehicle, and I looked in the back of it. And do you see the whitish uh, or discoloring stains that are located in some of the carpet that's uh, above the cutoff portion of the carpet? Yes. And uh, did, did that appear to be caused by a substance that uh, there was an odor of uh, in uh, the vehicle, if you know? Um, I, I didn't smell it, uh, but I recall uh, analyst uh, Avila telling me that it smelled. Now, um, would you expect a, a person uh, to clean uh, a carpeting using a bleach? I'm going to object as far as relevance. She she has experience with bleach and, and why why it might be used in certain circumstances. It's, it's overall. Would you expect someone to clean uh, something like an auto carpet with bleach? Not, not really, unless they were trying to remove something. Okay, so um, it, it, does bleach provide some advantage you're aware of if somebody does not want DNA to be detected in particular locations? Are you aware of the properties of bleach in your work that would make it the right item to use for cleaning a carpet if you want to make sure there's no DNA in certain locations? I'm going to object as far as argumentative and speculation as to why someone would use bleach to clean. There, there are specific properties she's aware of. your question. What, what if any properties are there uh, in bleach that disguise uh, what otherwise would be DNA uh, at a location? Um, so bleach removes stains and it also destroys DNA. It I also, mean, it also, it, it also destroys DNA. Thank you. So uh, you, you're aware of other uh, items people use to clean carpets, right, that are not bleach? That is correct, yes. And are those items items that also destroy DNA, or uh, is bleach the particular agent that destroys DNA? Uh, they may destroy DNA, but um, in our laboratory, uh, what we use to clean down to get rid of DNA so we don't have contamination is a 20% solution of bleach and water to wipe down our benches and our equipment. So, so this is the... Uh, item of choice of the crime lab to remove DNA. Is that right? It is. Um, unless some of the instrumentations bleach does corrode so that we don't use it on our instruments. But yes, on our bench tops, most definitely. Okay, so you didn't do the chemical testing of A1 because you didn't have enough. That's correct. All right. Yes. But did you do DNA testing to find out if it was going to be one of those sources of DNA you talked about, hair, semen, saliva, all those things. Yes, I ran it through the typical process that I run all the other uh, items through, yes. Just like all the other items we've talked about in this case? Yes, I did. Okay. And as to A1, I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 109, up here, yeah, 109, and ask you if, based on the packaging, uh, you are able to tell that this is in fact the item uh, that you did DNA testing on in regards to that, uh, that item that we've shown you. Yes, it is. And uh, what, if any, result did you get for A1 in terms of uh, a DNA profile? Uh, it was a single source male profile. And whose DNA uh, was that a match for, if any, uh, who, what, what person was it a match for? Uh, Rosalio Gutierrez. Now, you don't know whose minivan this is, correct? At any given time? Uh, yeah, I didn't take the van in. Um, it was not my primary uh, duty. Um, so I don't think I looked at any of the paperwork. And you as an analyst are not focused on any particular suspect. You have, you have no one in mind to figure out, you know, who's who in terms of the DNA determinations, do you? No. 
Now, are you able to give this jury an opinion as to whether the substance you tested for DNA in the stain or the pinhead you mentioned, uh, whether that, uh, uh, are you able to form an opinion as to what the source of DNA is? In other words, when we talk about semen, skin, all those things, do you have an opinion for the jury regarding which of the various sources that DNA comes from? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, and what is your opinion as to what the source of the DNA A1 is? Um, based on my education, training, and experience, uh, given the color uh, and the way that the, the stain looked, I would say that it would be blood. And uh, are you able uh, to indicate that, you're able to indicate that by appearance, is there something about the um, results that you had that also allows you to assist in that conclusion? Uh, yes, the type of genetic testing we do um, and the locations that we look at are human specific. So uh, this is human, this is, this is the DNA of, uh, that is human DNA, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay, so let's do this. So uh, are you able to do essentially a process of elimination as part of your analysis? Yes, that's part of our analysis. Okay. Uh, did this, uh, it, it, uh, based on your conclusions and the results, was this human hair? No, it was not. Was it saliva? No, it was not. Was it semen? No. Uh, was it, um, was it uh, skin cells uh, that uh, were simply skin scales without any, without uh, being another source? You know, there, there may have been skin cells, uh, but I, I couldn't say that for sure because you really can't see that. So I would say probably not skin cells. So your opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty is that this is the blood of Rosalio Gutierrez. Is that fair? Yes, that is fair. So uh, are you familiar with an email uh, that uh, you sent to a person named Angelina Gabrielle uh, back on uh, back in the time period of December 4th, 2020? Yes, I am. And uh, did you, uh, uh, in answer to a question uh, in that email, say we could not confirm it was blood in regards to this sample A1? Yes, I did. Okay, so how do you reconcile that email with what you're testifying today about? What, how do you explain that uh, you sent an email that said, uh, those words, but this is your testimony and conclusion uh, as we speak. She had asked me very specifically, can you confirm that it's blood? No, I could not. I did no uh, testing to determine that it was blood. She did not ask my opinion. And so now here expressing an opinion, uh, that wasn't contained in the email, wasn't asked for. That's correct. So, um, in your experience as a, a crime scene investigator, um, have you had to, on many occasions, make decisions about what items will be taken from a scene to do further testing on? Yeah, that's what we do at the scene. We look for the best evidence, the most probative evidence, what will have the most value to be tested. And is that, in fact, that's one of the primary jobs of you as a crime scene investigator when you're there from the crime lab, figuring out what you're going to take back to the crime lab and do more about, correct? That is correct. Okay. And uh, so um, how many times have you been to scenes where the blood evidence would literally have thousands of different droplets across an area? How many times would you say you've been at such a scene? A good majority of them, most of them. Okay. And have you ever on any of those occasions uh, taken samples from thousands of different locations. I guess I'm going to object to this line of questioning. First, um, as far as relevancy, um, I have not been given a report from this um, witness as to any sort of opinions of evidence collection in this case or any sort of opinions as, at all, nor was I provided a notice of exposition testimony and additionally, all these questions have been leading thus far. Uh, well, I can't deal with thus far because 
there wasn't a contemporaneous objection. So, uh, so I won't rule on that. The uh, remainder is oral. So again, your the question is: Have you ever had an occasion in any of those circumstances to test of the thousands, either thousands or hundreds of different locations in those uh, in those situations? No, I've never collected thousands of stains. I've never collected attic scene hundreds of stains. Okay, and uh, why is that? What What are you doing? I mean, if, if I mean, they'd, they'd all be available, right? You could test any one of them, uh, and uh, so why don't you do that? And and what is the thought process you're using to only test a, 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 a fraction or a portion of them? Judge, I'm going to object to relevancy again. How is her testimony of what she does relevant to this case? Yeah, she. This is the, the this, this has been placed an issue. The objection is overruled. So, as a as a person who does this for the state crime lab, can you, you do you understand the question? Please go ahead. Could you repeat it one more time? Sure. So, uh, of the thousands of stains, how do you prioritize what what which which ones of those fraction that you choose to uh, take out of there? So you, you look at the stains and you kind of look for patterns and so you look for a grouping. And so if you see an area that has a stain, you're going to look at it and you're going to take some random samplings of it. Um, then you're going to look at it to see is there anything, is there any part of it that maybe looks um, out of place? Um, so like it may have come from a different source, like uh, where they all find stains and then all of a sudden you've got this big round circular drop that would be something different, so that you would take that. Um, you, just, you just can't collect everything. There's time, there's resources. Um, it's just very difficult to do something like that. If, if, uh, have, have a number of these scenes that you've been at been indoor scenes? Indoor and outdoor scenes, okay. yes. So, you know, let's, if something happens, for instance, in a household, uh, there's a number of household items uh, throughout a home, correct? Correct. Uh, the house may have garbage. Uh, Objection leading. Well, he's not done with the question here. The house may have garbage, dishes, uh, food stored. Uh, it may have clothing uh, at, in different uh, places. There might be uh, all sorts of household items, almost an inf you know thousands and thousands of household items. Correction leading and relevancy. Well, it, it, it overruled on the second ground. Uh, it, it's argument to get back to that, uh, but uh, you can answer. Would you expect to see a household have thousands of items? Yes, I would. Okay. Do you uh, ever on the crime scenes test every household item that is uh, located in that household? Objection leading. Overruled. Go ahead. No, we do not collect or test every item in the household. Do you test every item that's in the garbage uh, located at the household if it's not in the midst of the crime scene? No, we do not. Do you test every item that's in every sink in the uh, house if you have no other evidence that uh, takes you to those sinks? No, we do not. Do you test uh, uh, every item um, that is on display in the house uh, if it does not have something that you see and observe as blood? Judge, I'm going to object as far as cumulative at this point. Uh, I'm not, and if you need to have a sidebar on it again, relevancy no, and cumulative. I, I, sometimes there are questions that no one would ask. That's when it's readily apparent, I think, uh, where we're going and what, what unfolding, and uh, the matter is adequately covered, so. Uh, move on to something else. What, if any, testing do you focus on in outdoor areas um, that uh, are not a part of the crime scene? Objection relevancy to, as to outdoor areas that aren't part of a crime scene. Cigarette butts. Well, 
Well, uh, first of all, I don't know that we've actually had a decision made as to what is the quote crime scene, uh, and uh, uh, overall, you can go ahead. Can you repeat that one more time? Sure, but it will be painful. Uh, so, uh, what if anything, or, or, or what do you, um, what if anything, can you say about testing items outside? of a, uh, uh, an indoor uh, uh, area that where you see a crime uh, or, or violent action occur? Objection, the statement of a violent action is argumentative. Additionally, I'd argue well, this is cumulative look, information that, from- If it was anything other than a violent event, like a party, it's not one I'd want to be at. So cumulative based on the previous testimony of, of the previous officer. Uh, overall. Please tell me you remember the question. I think I got it. Okay, good. Um, so generally, you know, you stick to what's in the tape, um, what's, what's at the scene or what's at the flight path. Um, so it would be something that would be obvious uh, or something that would be fresh, uh, something that would be new something like that. Can you tell me whether uh, you've tested cigarette butts in your life that have been outdoors? J Judge, I'm sorry, this is, this is expert testimony. Well, I, no, I, 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 it, it uh, less so than the fact that it's Friday afternoon. Let's move on. Well, I, I would, I'd like to ask her if, if DNA analysis on cigarette butts is impacted by rainy weather. That's I, a fair I, question. Okay, that's, so that's what I'll ask. Judge, Let me. he's using this witness as an expert witness in the field of crime scene investigation at this point. If she know, it, it, but it, there's I no notice to this and to her conclusions or her offering expositional testimony. Is they this, have to provide a notice. They did not do it. This is in, this is should not be able to go down any further. Is this uh, something that uh, you feel it competent for you that you're competent to respond to this knowledgeably? based upon your experience yes. and, and training? Yes. Go ahead. Um, yes, I have tested cigarette butts. Um, yes, if they are exposed to the elements, um, again, if the weather, the sunlight, the rain can wash away the DNA. Judge, um, I don't uh, have any further questions. Uh, question? Yeah, thank you. Could we, would this be a logical time to do a break? Well, actually, it, it is. Okay. Uh, uh, how lengthy would you accept, uh, expect your examination to be? And I'm not trying to rush you. No, I'd say approximately 30 minutes. Uh, let's take a break, and uh, please don't talk about the case during the break. Read about your list when you come.
I'm, I'm... Okay. Gotcha. You can control... Again? Yeah. Oh, no, we probably won't have another witness then. Okay. Yeah. And now they're telling me someone trying to find On December, excuse me, March 10th, 2021, so nearly two years ago, just shy of two years, 
but that's what she would testify about. What we're here today is trial by ambush. And very clearly, the, constant, the, excuse me, the statutory scheme is in 971.23 sub 1 and E, is that if they're going to offer expert testimony, which this is, even if it's expository, if they're going to offer that, they have to give notice. They gave notice about one part, but now they're trying to sneak in this other part. And just because, you know, that they're trying to bootleg it off of some earlier testimony about crime scene analysis or, um, a, a, excuse me, crime scene processing. I'm going to interrupt you. I, I apologize, but I'm actually going to interrupt you. Okay. I'm sure that will come as no shock. <laughs> um, the, um, I, I don't know, did she actually, was, did she actually give an expert opinion or did she merely restore, uh, uh, state the historical fact that she has experience with cigarette butts that have been exposed to the elements and whether she had been able to obtain any results as, uh, in her studies. Oh. Mr. Graves specifically asked her every single thing that you're offering an opinion about, which that is an opinion. No, I said the historical fact. Have you been able to? I may be not. I may be wrong. Well, I didn't think he act actually asked for an opinion as opposed to an experience. Well, he asked both. He might not have used the word opinion, but he's asking both. That's essentially what he's asking for. And that's why he was going through her qualifications about all those years, you know, responding to crime scenes and all of that, none of which we had notice of either. Yeah, and he's asking about the bleach questions in the van and, and all of that. That's all after he's already qualified as an expert and presented it to the jury like, you know, she's the, um, the top dog over at the crime lab, and she might be, but we weren't given notice that this was going to be part of her testimony. You know? I mean, how do we respond to that? Do we ask for an adjournment so we can go out and find two more experts, one on bleach and one on, you know, uh, crime scene processing? I mean, we're sort of left flat-footed here without any recourse. Well, and your recourse, uh, before we got onto the record, I thought you were talking about striking something? Yeah, I wanted to strike everything that's beyond the questions about, yes, I found Ros Rosalia's, uh, excuse me, um, DNA on this sample, boom. And then everything going forward should be stricken. Yeah, Judge, you know, this is a jury, I guess, you know, my answer to all of these questions is this is a jury trial. Uh, the, they have a notice of expert. They know it's a crime lab witness. They present uh, through their cross-examination a theory of the case, a defense of the case, Everything else that the state is providing here is rebuttal. Uh, and so we are allowed to, we, we wouldn't have to notice a person in terms of rebuttal. I had no idea I was going to ask her the bleach question until this, uh, until the cross-examination stuff has been happening. And so I formulated the bleach question based on direct response to what's happening. I had no idea I was going to ask her about cigarette butts. It's come up because of the cross-examination. That's what rebuttal is. And I am rebutting it uh, uh, with the witness who's available and who is here. Um, and uh, there is no uh, requirement that to counter what the defense said. Uh, I had no idea they were going to show pictures of cigarette butts. I had no idea that they were uh, going to indicate that uh, this was a uh, this was a not a cleaned uh, vehicle uh, uh, with bleach uh, stains. And and so uh, these are uh, pieces of information that are uh, being talked about in cross-examination. Okay. There's an available expert who provides some opinions about those things based on her own experience and knowledge. Uh, I, I, there, there is no way I would be able to notice about every different possibility. And that isn't the expectation of the law. Jury trials will have some moments of surprise. Um, and the court has said a couple of times, when you ask a question, sometimes it doesn't turn out well for you because sometimes there's an ability to counter it from the other side. How would I ever be able to anticipate all the things I might ask an expert based on what they say. Judge, rebuttal 
is when the defense brings something new to the table that then they want to react to. Everything, every single question that was asked on cross-examination, every single picture, every single item that was discussed here has all come from the state, all of it. So there's zero surprise. I'm so surprised about cigarette butts. We got the pictures from them. But I, 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 uh, I'm working from my memory now, but I think that what the state is required to give the uh, expert notice on is what the state intends to prove by expert testimony at the trial. Mr. Gravely is saying he didn't intend to offer this evidence and only has done so in response to what has been offered by the defense. Yes, that would be a fine argument if that was something that was offered by the defense that was offered by the defense that was new. But none of this is new, none of it. Well, it All is in the sense, you know, there's such a universe of things that uh, could have been offered by the defense. Um, and we discussed them a few days ago, we, other things. We were offering though, Judge. We were cross-examining their own their own evidence. We don't, we're not reading the statutes the same way. You're, you're allowed to rebut someone's opening statement. Rebuttal is legitimate. There, there are moments in, there are in Wisconsin where, where opening statement can be rebuttal. And we don't have been just that. We have extensive cross-examination that I rebut. Uh, Attorney, Attorney Muller here, I'd like to make a point that the state used analyst Treffinger as basically to provide expert t testimony to the effects that bleach has on the hemoglobin protein of blood. I did not cross, I have not cross-examined on products of bleach and the effect that that has, um, nor have I asked any questions about bleach cleanup in the van. I have not offered any of that. I have not questioned on it. I have not done anything. Yet the state just used Analyst Treffinger as an expert to provide her opinion on the effects of bleach and cleaning in her in her experience on that particular on that particular conclusion. And I want to make it known. Well, I'm going to stop you. I'm going to stop you finish, now. Just no, one last not thing. yet. Please. Only if you. Uh, get the first question right. Did you, um, was there a contemporaneous objection made? Yes, I made About the bleach? Yes, I made the objection. I was objecting during that whole line of questioning about how it was calling for expert testimony. Yes, you did. Um, so, but to my point before about, I, I want it to really be known that in the very beginning of the state's questioning of this witness, the state asked, when I'm asking uh, about your opinion, you I'm going to ask that it's, you give your opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. I'm not gonna ask you to every single one of those. And then she gave an opinion about bleach and cleanup and the effects that that has on the protein hemoglobin. That's expert testimony. We were not provided notice of that and that must be struck. And just a, one final point, uh, Mr. Gravely is talking about how trials have surprises sometimes, and there's going to be a rebuttal. Yeah, that's fine, but it's not the gunfight at the OK Corral, okay? And so we have, you know, we have a street fight, and then suddenly one of his people is up on the roof taking pot shots at us, and we have no possible notice that that's happening, and that's what this is. Well, I, uh, I, I, my, I, I, I'll, I'll think about it over the weekend. I will tell you that uh, my current bias, and I've been told I shouldn't use that word in, a, in um, an explanatory sense, uh, because it has such an ugly identification, but my current inclination uh, is to uh, over, overrule your objection. But I'll think about it over the weekend. Um, <clears throat> And um, anything else before I call the jury down? No, Judge, uh, Ms. Treffinger, uh, who is uh, testifying here, has a funeral for a close relative who she must be, she leaves for tomorrow. So, so I'm just asking the court to, that, in any way we can, uh, allow her to be done today. Well, you're a part of that, you know. I, I, I'm aware. Okay. 
Would you come down, please? Okay. How long did that 20 minutes last? 30? We did pretty well. The detective come in. Uh, let's proceed. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, is it okay if I come and grab those exhibits, Judge, that were the, her reports? You may.
talking about some of the items that were tested. There were several, several items, um, such as the traffic gear shifter, things of that, things included in State's Exhibit 39 that you had said the DNA of Mr. Gutierrez and Mr. Anderson were excluded, correct? That's correct. So I want to draw your attention, and, and this is more for purposes for understanding to the jury, to page six of your report, that being exhibit 39. I'm zoom in here. So can you explain what this chart is for? The under 31? Correct. Um, so that's if um, uh, a type of statistic is used, um, those are the um, stats, those are the way those stats are presented. Probabilistic genet genet probab gen genetic statistics, it's STR mix is what it is. Okay. Sorry. No, you're fine. And so when someone's excluded, when there's a mixture of DNA, and you note that they're excluded, um, that means that there's zero chance, zero probability that their DNA is included in that, correct? Correct. Right. So in these cases where you came to conclusions that Mr. Gutierrez was excluded, that meant there's zero chance um, that his DNA was located on those items. Yes. So in um, State Exhibit 39, I'm going to draw your attention to page 2 of 6. Um, there was item Z, which were swabs reportedly collected from the cell phone, correct? Correct. And in your report, you had noted for item Z that, I'm going to zoom out just a little so we can see all of that that there's additional possible trace allele was detected. However, no conclusions will be made regarding the allele. Can you explain what that means to a jury? Uh, so that means that there, a trace, there may be one, two um, location or um, items that are there, but you, they're just, a trace and you can't make any comparisons to them, you can't draw any conclusions to them. And there's different types of trace, um, different types of trace alleles. There could be trace and there could be an artifact. An artifact is a little bit different than a trace. Can you explain the difference? A trace uh, is uh, maybe a, a little bit of DNA, but not enough, but it's showing up at this genetic location. An artifact is something um, that used to be more uh, common, like in the, in the analysis process, uh, you would get a spike, an artifact, which may or may not have been DNA, it just could have been a blip in the machinery, um, things like that. And so in this case, so if I can just maybe more simplify it, so artifact, if you see an, art, an allele that could be an artifact, it could just be a byproduct of the testing equipment, something that you cannot be certain is actually remnants of an individual's DNA, so can't make any conclusions. That's correct, yeah. But when you say something is a trace allele, then you're saying that it is trace DNA, so it is a component of someone's DNA structure. Yes, it could, it could possibly be from someone's DNA, but there's just not enough of it to render an opinion. So for item Z, the cell phone, um, you had made the opinion and conclusion that it was a trace allele, not an artifact allele. That's correct, yes. Okay, just a few so kind. And what was the exhibit number on that? 186? 186? Um, I'm showing what's been previously marked as 186. It's going to show up on the screen.
Okay, so before we get into what Exhibit 186, the reports that we show were just shown are just simply your final conclusions, correct? Correct. That before you do that, there are a lot of tests and a lot more documents that are produced um, that we didn't see in those reports, right? Right, the, the paperwork associated with my case file, yes. Okay, so the state's been kind enough to put up what's been marked as Defense Exhibit 186. Um, can you explain to the jury what what is being shown before them? I can, I can zoom in further if she wants. Yes, please. Is that okay? Yeah, you can. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so that's the that's what the data looks like when it comes off the analyzer. And, and this sample, this is a reagent blank number five. Hey, can you scroll down? Just the, to the second. Right to the second one, yep. So how about this right here? Yeah, that, that's the data from item Z1. And in this case? Correct, yes. Okay. And you've seen these, this data? Yes, I have. And so, um, I guess if you could um, explain to the jury, so in, and I guess I'm going to have it go to page two, the top of page two, um, a little bit further down. Right there is perfect. Thank you. So you see the yellow squared box that says TH01. Um, Correct. Can you explain, and then the other ones too, the VWA, D21S, 211, can you explain to the jury what those letters and numbers mean? So, so the letters on the, the, in the yellow box and the green box, those are the locations uh, that we're looking at. Um, and then the peaks, those are, the, that is the type at that location. And so those are, so under TH01 in this situation, and this is for item Z1, correct? That is correct, yes. And Z1 was the swabs taken from the DNA sample from the cell phone? Yes, it is. And so you had noted in your report that there was a trace allele detected. So in the um, TH01 um, locus, do you see the trace allele that you were referring to? Yes, I do. And can you tell the jury what that is? Uh, that's uh, an allele that's uh, very low, and that's what I'm calling a trace. Uh, which number is that? I'm sorry. It's 9.3. Okay, and so that's the 9.3 allele is a tra trace DNA of an unknown individual, correct? Yes, it is. And in your report, you said you couldn't make any conclusions about that particular trace allele, correct? That is correct, yes. But you would be able to look at the locus of Mr. Anderson, TH01, and look at his alleles to determine if he carries that allele, correct? Yes, I could. Um, I'd ask that Exhibit 186 be moved into evidence. So objection? No. Thank you. marked as Defense Exhibit 187. Doesn't zoom out anymore, so first before I show this, I'm going to hand it to you, and if you could just say what Defense Exhibit 187 is. Um, it is a, uh, an overall of the profile that I developed from item U1. And what was item U1? I think there's notation on there. Oh, there is, there is. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's a standard from Zachariah Anderson. 
Okay, thank you. And you'd say that the lo is it loci, lo loci, I can never remember. Locus. The locus, okay. And then um, all of those are listed and the alleles for Mr. Anderson, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. So when we look at the TH01 alleles, and I'll, I'll zoom in here as much as I can. Which alleles does Mr. Anderson's DNA carry for TH01? A seven and a nine. And so the trace allele that you had found or located on item B1 was 9.3, correct? That is correct, yes. And Mr. Anderson does not carry that allele? No, he does not. So that trace DNA on the cell phone does not belong to Mr. Anderson? I can't make an opinion on that. I, I don't know whose allele it is but or isn't. The 9.3 allele scientifically could not be Mr. Anderson's? It does not show up in his profile, no. The state had asked you a series of questions about item A1, which was the um, swab taken from the stain in the back of the, the van. Do you remember that line of questioning? Yes, I do. And so, um, and you had testified that this stain was the size of basically a, a needle head or a pin head. Yes, a, a pin head, yes. Very, very, very small. Yes, it was. And so when you swab that, did you swab that yourself? No, I did not. But you'd agree that when an item is swabbed, um, did they take the whole stain off? Do you know? Uh, that's what, when in our conversation with the analyst, I had said, collect the whole stain, as much of it as you can, onto one swab. Okay, so when they swab that, they're also getting any potential items, anything really, that could have been on top of the stain, correct? Correct. Anything in that area that they swabbed would be collected on the swab. So anything that could have been below, on the, underneath the stain as well, correct? That is possible, yes. So you had talked about how the state had walked you through exclusion and not exclusion about the source of the DNA in this case, um, and the state asked if you were able to give an opinion on whether it came from blood. You remember that line of questioning? Yes, I do. Um, the state had, though, asked you about, um, about the possibility that it could come from skin cells, and you said that there could have been skin cells present, correct? Yes, that's possible. So it's also possible that the DNA was from skin cells. Correct? Yes, that could be a possibility. And so I want to go back then to, um, you're obviously extremely qualified. Um, you've been running tests um, to these natures. And in your in your day-to-day -day field, when you give a report about whether something is or isn't blood um, at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, in order to come to that conclusion, it requires testing, correct? That is correct, we do testing, yes. And there was no test completed on that stain, correct? There was no screening test, no confirmatory, confirmatory test done on that stain. So there's, there was no, there's no way to confirm that item A1 was blood. Correct. Objection, that's argumentative. She's already stated her opinion based on observation does confirm it. So to say I, there's no way to confirm is an argumentative question. Overall. Do you, so, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Do you need me to? Yes, please. Yes. So based on the fact that there was no testing, that there's no way to scientifically confirm that the stain or what the swab or the, whatever it was, was blood, correct? Correct, I did not confirm the swab for blood. So it's possible that it could be blood, also possible it could be from, um, not the stain, but the DNA could be from skin cells. That would be a possibility. I have no further questions for this witness. 
Well, it, you, you've indicated it's possible that it's skin cells. Is that the opinion you are rendering here today to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? It's, it's possible that it's skin cells. Uh, in my experience, uh, skin cells don't give um, such a robust uh, profile uh, because you need a lot of them. They have to be viable. DNA, I'm sorry, blood gives you a very good profile. So based on how robust this profile is, do you continue to have the opinion you've indicated previously that to a reasonable degree of uh, scientific certainty that this uh, sample was blood? That, that is my opinion, that it was blood. Nothing else? Any questions? No. Oh. No. Um, let's see. Can we just confer for just a minute? You may. Uh, short witness and we do not anticipate any additional witnesses today. Short. That's what that's what we anticipate. I um, we just that was the subject of our conference. Brief. Good point. Uh, raise your right hand please you <laughs> do you sound as where the testimony you are about to give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be God. Yes, Please be seated. <laughs> Can't move the dirt. Could you please state your name for the record and spell it? Christy Raddatz Ortiz, K R I S T Y R A D D A T Z hyphen O R T I Z. And Ms. Raddatz Ortiz, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Yes. How many times? Twice. Did you know somebody named Rosalio Gutierrez? Yes, ma'am. And who was Rosalio Gutierrez to you? He was a former partner, and he and I have a 14-year-old son together. And that 14-year-old son back in May of 2020, would he have been 11? Yes. And when did you first meet Mr. Gutierrez, best you can remember? Around 2001. And what year, in general, was your son born, your, your joint son? 2008. 
and uh, obviously you guys broke up, fair to say? Yes. After the two of you stopped your romantic relationship, did Mr. Gutierrez remain in your son's life? Yes, most definitely. Would you have considered him to be an involved parent? Very involved. And I'm assuming as your son got older, he and his father had interests in common, things they liked to do together. Very much so. What, what kind of things did they like to do together? What were their, their in common interests? One of them was um, baseball, but they both loved the outdoors and just learning, learning together, learning anything. And you, you talked about baseball. Was that a, a lifelong passion for uh, Rosalio? It was. And was he happy when your son also picked up that same kind of passion for the game? Yeah. What kind of things for, uh, revolving around baseball would they do together? They would go to they go out in the yard and play catch together. They would go to um, baseball games when they could. They would go. They would watch the the World League Little League World Series and that on TV. They would um, do. Practices. He was always a, there for practice. He was always there for his games. They would go beyond. They'd go early, stay late. Um, those types of things. And your son's actually pretty good at baseball, from what I hear. Is he that is. Accurate? Yeah. And so was he both at back in 2020 on a local little league team, but also on some traveling teams? He was on a, a local little league team. I think. Uh, Kiwanis and was getting ready to start the, the traveling team. And did Rosalio uh, take on a coaching role for that Little League baseball team? He did. And was that something that uh, Rosalio was excited about? Yes, very excited. Had he been looking forward to being an official coach? Uh, you object as far as hearsay and speculation as to what Mr. Gutierrez was or was not looking forward to. And if there's going to be questioning on it, there needs to be better foundation. Um, I think that's a fair observation. Mr. Esertiz, did you have occasion to observe Mr. Gutierrez during these practices and these games of your son while being present? Yes. And were you able to, based on your observations of how he was acting and what he was doing at these different practices and games, uh, develop an opinion uh, about what you would characterize his behavior like? Yes. And, and based on your observations of Rosalio at these practices and games that you've described, how would you describe what you observe to be his feelings regarding being involved in your son's baseball career? Enthused. And obviously you knew that your son was in the Little League uh, team? Yes. And as part of signing him up, was there also a sign up for coaches? Yes. And for the season, for 2020, uh, based on your knowledge, was Rosalio Gutierrez set to be a coach of your son's Little League team? Yes, he was. And was that slightly different than in years prior where he had been more of a volunteer, if you know? Yes. So he was actually going to be an official on field right. coach. It's fair to say, in knowing uh, Mr. Gutierrez, that he didn't have a ton of money. Yeah. But was baseball something that he, for your son, sought to spend whatever money he did have on? Yes, he would. And how did he do that? I don't object as far as speculation and relevance. Um. Judge, if I may. Uh, the question actually doesn't seem like it's uh, seeking uh, information that would be outside of her personal knowledge. Uh, and uh, she tells me it's going to be brief examination, so I'm not taking her out of her. So, and, and Judge, when uh, has baseball ever not been relevant? Well, <laughs> who, can, who can argue with that? Uh, so go ahead. So would Rosalio spend what money he did have on things like baseball for your son? What he could, yeah. And would that involve things like extra hitting lessons, coaching lessons, things like that? Yeah. Now, 
at this time, back in May of 2020, who did your son primarily live with? He lived with me. And distance-wise, how far approximately was your residence at that time from Mr. Gutierrez's residence? About a three-minute car drive, so very close. And so I know that this was COVID time back in May of 2020, but around this time frame, how often was your son seeing his father? Probably at least um, three to four times a week because we would switch back and forth with who had him during during uh, virtual school. And I guess prior to uh, the world ending in COVID mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, was your son's actual school bus uh, pickup stop outside of Mr. Gutierrez's residence? Yes, it was. And so on days when you would have your son and you would bring him to the bus stop would he occasionally see his father then as well yes we would would you consider your custody arrangement to be casual in terms of where your son would be staying on any given given day very casual sometimes it changed you know at the last minute and at this point in may of 2020 did your son uh, have his own cell phone yes he did and was that a way he would communicate with uh, Mr. Gutierrez when he wasn't with him? Yes, all the time. How would you describe the frequency of that communication uh, when you had your son uh, with you uh, and he would be reaching out to his father? Um, probably at least once a day, if not multiple times a day. So they, they talked a lot? Yes, whether it was text or talk. Back as far as hearsay. Yeah. Now directing your attention to May 15th and May 16th of 2020, for that weekend leading up to Sunday night the 17th, where was your son uh, staying for those days? He was with his father. And was that unusual? No. And uh, besides uh, your son and uh, Rosalio, were you aware of anyone else was also with them for those couple of days uh, leading up to the, the night of the 17th? His younger sister, Ava. Okay. I'm just going to show you a picture of what's been marked as States Exhibit 55. I'm approaching is what's been marked as States Exhibit 55. Can you just tell me if you recognize the people in this picture? Yes. And just for brevity's sake, would this be Mr. Gutierrez? Yes. Your son and his other daughter? Yes. Okay. Judge, I would move States Exhibit 55 into evidence and ask to publish it to the jury, not on the electronics, uh, given the identities of the children that we would uh, the broadcast. Uh, any objection? No. Go ahead. talked a lot about how close uh, your son was with his father. After the breakup uh, of your relationship, did you and Mr. Gutierrez remain close? Uh, we did. Would you have considered him to be a good friend of yours in May of 2020? Yes. When you would exchange your son on those different days, would you often have conversations with each other? Yeah. Did you keep in touch with, with each other in your lives? Yes, we did. 
direct your attention to May 17th in the hours close to 8 p.m. Uh, do you recall uh, being at your house roughly a little before 8 p.m. that day? Yes, I do. And what do you recall happening that day regarding your son and Mr. Gutierrez? I recall my son being dropped off by his dad. I didn't see him drop him off, but I recall him dropping him off. He came in and said, hey, mom, I'm home, and brought his things to his room, and we got ready for the next day. Um, my fiance, who was in the driveway, saw him drop him off, and they waved at each other, and, and that was that. Since May 17th of 2020, have you heard from Rosalia Gutierrez at all? Not at all. To the best of your knowledge, uh, obviously in raising your son, has your son heard from Mr. Gutierrez at all? No. Have there been any further contacts from Mr. Gutierrez to your son's phone since May 17th of 2020? No. Was Mr. Gutierrez the type of person that would have just disappeared from his son's life? No, he wasn't. And how do you know that? Because I don't think there's anything in this world that could separate him from his son and his daughter. I, there's just nothing I could imagine that would... He loved his kids, that they were his world. And obviously, we're talking about almost three years ago now. So he, Mr. Gutierrez, would have missed countless birthdays? Yes. First days of school? Yep. Sporting events? Mm-hmm. Important school events? Yeah. And do you believe that's something Mr. Gutierrez would have voluntarily ever did? Never. No. Question from May 17th. Do you know roughly what time your son was dropped off on May 17th? It was somewhere between 7.30 and 7, and 8 o'clock. I think it was between like, it was a little closer to 8, maybe 7.40, something like that. And I, I don't remember the exact time, but yeah, between 7.30 and 8 p.m. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you remember speaking with um, officers in this case? I believe it was one officer, Officer Ruha. Yes. And um, and you had explained to him what had happened when um, your son was dropped off on May 17th, 2020, correct? Yes. And um, you had information that Mr. Gutierrez was going to be going to Eileen Knoll's house to check on her sink after dropping off your son, correct? I don't recall. If I were to show you a copy of your, your written statement, would that help refresh your memory? Did that help refresh your recollection? I'm still reading it. Oh, sure. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you.
repeat your question, please? So, did you um, receive information that Mr. Gutierrez would was heading over to Eileen Knoll's house to check on her safe? Your Honor, I'm going to object. This calls for hearsay. It's very specific in the, the statement that that is coming in through a third party witness. Sure, I'm using it for, um, not for the truth of the matter asserted, but rather effect on the listener for other reasons than of what um, this witness's perception of was of what Mr. Gutierrez could have possibly been going to do. Your Honor, which she... Uh, effect on the listener is not an exception to the air symbol. Yes, yes it is. It is? Present sense impression. Oh. Effect on the listener. Uh, I, I, I've never heard that particular exception expressed that way. I'm not saying you're wrong. I've just never heard it said that way. And that is the least favorite of all of the exceptions to the hearsay rule. Um, Your Honor, if I may be heard on this. Why not? The answer calls for what a third party told her at some point, supposedly, but then also this isn't a present sense impression because it's days later that allegedly she's telling it to law enforcement. So it's a level of hearsay. It's, it's not appropriate to come into evidence given exactly what's written in the statement. And also, it clearly is for the truth of the matter asserted, otherwise she'd be speculating on. Well, she said it wasn't for the matter asserted. It was for the effect on the listener, but I didn't buy that. Well, that's fine. Uh, that's almost always irrelevant. Well, I, I'll rephrase it. Um, you had um, a guess of where Mr. Gutierrez was going on May 17, 2020, correct? Objection. It calls for hearsay to answer her speculative guess on where he may have been going. Well, it, it actually, I think this question is probably okay, but it's going to be the end of the line. Yeah, that's fine. If you need to look at your written statement again. I had... Well, wait a minute. Right. That's kind of hearsay-ish. I'll, I'll rephrase it. I'll just ask it straight up. Did you think that Mr. Gutierrez might have had a date that night and didn't want to tell your son? No. no. Looking at a sink is a No, 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 ma'am. Thank you. Go on. Okay, I'll move Some, on. Yeah, please. Your Honor, I'd ask that that be struck from the record as argumentative and just inappropriate. Well, I don't know if I'd embrace those reasons, but uh, <clears throat> you can disregard, well, whatever, what response there was to the question. Go ahead. You had knowledge that um, Mr. Gutierrez started dating a woman with the Facebook name of Sadie Jane, correct? Not until after... Uh, we realized he was missing. Um, and did you ever meet Sadie Jane prior to May 17, 2020? If I didn't know of her, then no, I did not. No. And Mr. Gutierrez, you said you had spoke with him on a regular basis, yes. correct? And he never mentioned her to you? No, he did not. I have no further questions for this witness. Any no, questions? Nothing based on that. Uh, you may step down, ma'am. As promised, Judge. Very well done. All right, uh, we're done for the day? Okay. No. Um, a well-earned weekend. Um, and uh, please don't read, watch, or listen to any account of the trial. Don't discuss the case with anyone, even with another juror or a member of your household. Uh, any questions, anybody? Have a great weekend.